This is released for the sake of education. This is a brief key insight about all the concepts of the book. We provide free audiobooks, key insights, summaries and brief study notes on the concepts of the books. So make sure to subscribe and become a part of our family. Without wasting any second, let's dive into the ocean of words. How to make people like you in 90 seconds or less by Nicholas Boothman, read by the author. Preface. The secret of success is not very hard to figure out. The better you are at connecting with other people, the better the quality of your life. I first discovered the secrets of getting along with people during my career as a fashion and advertising photographer. Whether it was working with a single model for a page in Vogue or 400 people aboard a ship to promote a Norwegian cruise line, it was obvious that for me photography was more about clicking with people than about clicking with a camera. What's more, it didn't matter if the shoot was taking place in the lobby of the Ritz Hotel in San Francisco or a ramshackle hut on the side of a mountain in Africa. The principles for establishing rapport were universal. For as long as I can remember, I found it easy to get along with people. Could it be a gift? Is there such a thing as a natural talent for getting along with people? Or is it something we learn along the way? And if it can be learnt, can it be taught? I decided to find out. I knew from 25 years of shooting still photographs for magazines all over the world that attitude and body language are paramount to creating a strong visual impression. Magazine ads have less than two seconds to capture the reader's attention. I was also aware that there's a way of using body language and voice tone to make perfect strangers feel comfortable and cooperative. My third realization was that a few well-chosen words could evoke expression, mood and action in almost any subject. With these insights under my belt, I decided to look a little deeper. Why is it easier to get on with some people than others? Why can I have an interesting conversation with a person I've just met, while someone else might dismiss the same person as boring or threatening? Clearly, something must be happening on a level beyond our conscious awareness, but what is it? It was at this point in my quest that I came across the early work of Drs. Richard Bandler and John Grinder at UC Santa Cruz in a subject with the unwieldy name of Neuro Linguistic Programming, or NLP for short. Many of the things I've been doing intuitively as a photographer, these two men and their colleagues had documented and analyzed as the art and science of personal excellence. Among a fountain of new insights, they revealed that everyone has a favorite sense. Find this sense and you have the key to unlock a person's heart and mind. As my new path became clearer, I set aside my cameras and resolved to focus on how people work on the inside as well as how they look on the outside. Over the next few years, I studied with Dr. Bandler in London and New York and earned my license as a Master Practitioner of Neuro Linguistic Programming. I studied irresistible language patterns in the United States and Canada and England and delved into everything to do with the brain's part in human connectivity. I worked with actors, comedians and drama teachers in America and storytellers in Africa to adapt improvisational drills into exercises that enhance conversation skills. Since then, I've gone on to give seminars and talks all over the world, working with all kinds of groups and individuals, from sales teams to teachers, from leaders of organizations who thought they knew it all, to children so shy that people thought they were dim-witted. And one thing became very clear. Making people like you in 90 seconds or less is a skill that can be taught to anyone in a natural and easy way. Over and over I've been told, Nick, this is amazing, why don't you write it down? Well, I listened. I have, and here it is. Part 1. First Contact. Chapter 1. People Power. When people like you, they see the best in you. Connecting with other people brings infinite rewards. And whether it's landing the job, winning the promotion, gaining the sale, charming a new partner, electrifying your audience, or passing inspection by the future in-laws, if people like you, they see the best in you. The welcome mat is out and a connection is yours for the making. Other people are your greatest resource. They give birth to you, they feed you, dress you, provide you with money, make you laugh and cry, they comfort you, heal you, invest your money, service your car, 
and bury you. We can't live without them. We can't even die without them. Connecting is what our ancestors were doing thousands of years ago when they gathered around the fire to eat woolly mammoth steaks or stitch together the latest animal hide fashions. It's what we do when we hold quilting bees or golf tournaments, conferences and yard sales. It underlies our cultural rituals from the, the serious to the frivolous, from weddings and funerals to Barbie doll conventions and spaghetti eating contests. Even the most antisocial of artists and poets who spend long, cranky months painting in a studio or composing in a cubicle off their bedroom are usually hoping that through their creations they will eventually connect with the public. And connection lies at the very heart of those three pillars of our democratic civilization. Government, religion, <coughs> and television. Yes, television. Given that you can discuss Friends or the X-Files with folks from Berlin to Brisbane, a case must be made for the Tube's ability to help people connect all over the globe. Thousands of people impact all aspects of our life, be it the weatherman at the TV studio in a neighboring city or the technician at the phone company across the continent or the woman in Tobago who picks the mangoes for your fruit salad. Every day, wittingly or unwittingly, we make a myriad of connections with people all over the world. The benefits of connecting. Our personal growth and evolution and the evolution of societies come about as a result of connecting with our fellow humans, whether as a band of young warriors setting out on a hunt or a group of co-workers heading out to the local pizzeria after work on a Friday. As a species, we are instinctively driven to come together and form groups of friends, associations and communities. Without them, we cannot exist. Connect and live longer. Making connections is what our grey matter does best. It receives information from our senses and processes it by making associations. The brain delights in and learns from these associations. It grows and flourishes when it's making connections. People do the same thing. It's a scientific fact that people who connect live longer. In their gem of a book, Keep Your Brain Alive, Lawrence Katz and Manning Rubin quote studies by the MacArthur Foundation and the International Longevity Center in New York and at the University of Southern California. These studies show that people who stay socially and physically active have longer lifespans. This doesn't mean hanging out with the same old crowd and pedaling around on an exercise bike. It means getting out there and making new friends. When you make new connections in the outside world, you make new connections in the inside world, in your brain. This keeps you young and alert. Edward Halliwell, in his very savvy book, Connect, cites the 1979 Alameda County study by Dr. Lisa Berkman of the Harvard School of Health Sciences. Dr. Berkman and her team carefully looked at 7,000 people aged 35 to 65 over a period of nine years. Their study concluded that people who lack social and community ties are almost three times more likely to die of medical illness than those who have more extensive contacts. And all this, independent of socioeconomic status and health practices like smoking, consuming alcohol, obesity, or physical activity. Connect and get cooperation. Other people can help you take care of your needs and desires. Whatever it is you need in this life, romance, a dream job, a, a ticket to the Rose Bowl, the chances are pretty high that you'll need someone else's help to get it. If people like you, they'll see the best in you, and they'll be disposed to give you their time and their efforts. And the better the quality of the rapport you have with them, the higher the level of their cooperation. Connect and feel safe. Connecting is good for the community. After all, a community is the combination of a lot of connections, common beliefs, achievements, values, interests, and geography. Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither was Detroit. 3,000 years ago, in what today we call Rome, Indo-Europeans connected to hunt, survive, and generally look out for one another. 300 years ago, a French fur trader turned up to create a safe haven for his business. He started making connections, and pretty soon Detroit was born. We have a basic physical need for other people. There are shared mutual benefits in the community, so we look out for each other. A connected community provides its members with strength and safety. When we feel strong and safe, we can put our energy into evolving socially, culturally, and spiritually. Connect and feel love. Finally, we benefit from each other emotionally. We are not closed self-regulating systems, but Open loops, regulated, disciplined, encouraged, reprimanded, supported, 
and validated by the emotional feedback we receive from others. From time to time, we meet someone who influences our emotions and vital body rhythms in such a pleasurable way that we call it love. But be it through body language, gestures, facial expressions, tone of voice, or words alone, other people make our hard times more bearable and our good times much sweeter. We use the emotional input from other humans as much as we do the air we breathe and the food we eat, deprive us of emotional and physical contact, and we will wither and die just as surely as if we were deprived of food. That's why we hear stories of children in orphanages in other parts of the world who grow sickly and weak despite being adequately fed and clothed. People with autism may desire emotional and physical contact but can languish because they're hindered by their lack of social skills. And how often have you heard about one spouse in a 50-year marriage who, despite being medically healthy, dies a few short months or even weeks after the death of the other spouse? Food and shelter aren't enough. We need each other. And we need love. Face to face. The internet has been touted as the ultimate tool for bringing people together into shared communities of interest. And it's true if you're searching for other teddy bear collectors in Toledo or mud wrestlers in Minsk. You may find them on the web. For people who are housebound because of disabilities or illness, the web can also be a godsend. Still, we have to remember that spending hours in front of a screen typing into cyberspace is a poor substitute for the full spectrum of experience offered by face-to-face -face time with another person. You might well meet someone in a chat room who interests you romantically, but would you agree to marry before meeting a few times in person? You need to be in a person's presence for a while in order to pick up all the verbal and non-verbal cues. The atmosphere created by physical and mental presence is as important as surface attraction, if not more so. For example, what sort of environment do the two of you create? How spontaneous are you? How strong is your need for conversation? What about your openness, your supportiveness? What about companionship? If you don't meet each other's emotional needs, you may be heading for failure. These things can only be determined by face-to-face -face contact. Only then can you tell if you're really connecting. Why likability works. When people like you, they feel natural and comfortable around you. And they'll want to give you their attention and happily open up for you. Likeability has something to do with how you look, but a lot more to do with how you make people feel. My old nanny, who brought me up to be passionate about people, used to talk about having a sunny disposition. She'd take me out on the promenade and we'd spot the people who had sunny dispositions and all those who were sour pusses. She told me we can choose what we want to be, and then we'd laugh at the sour pusses because they look so serious. Likeable people give loud and clear signals of their willingness to be sociable. They reveal that their public communication channels are open. Embedded in these signals is evidence of self-confidence, sincerity, and trust. Likeable people expose a warm, easy-going public face with an outgoing radiance that says, I'm ready to connect, I'm open for business. They are welcoming and friendly, and they get other people's attention. Why 90 seconds? Time is precious. Time costs money. Don't waste my time. Time has become increasingly a sought-after commodity. We budget our time, make it stand still, slow it down or speed it up, and lose sense of it and distort it. We even buy time-saving devices, yet time is one of the few things we can't save. It's forever unfolding. In bygone days, we were inherently more respectful of one another and devoted more time to the niceties of getting to know someone and explore common ground. In the hustle and bustle of life today, though, we rush about with so many deadlines attached to everything that, unfortunately, we don't have the time or take the time to invest in getting to know each other well. We look for associations, make appraisals and assumptions, and form decisions all in the first couple of seconds and frequently before a word is even spoken. Friend or foe, fight or flight, opportunity or threat, familiar or foreign. Instinctively, we assess undress and best guess each other and if we can't present ourselves fast and favorably we run the risk of being politely or impolitely passed over. The second reason for establishing likability in 90 seconds or less has to do with the human attention span. Believe it or not the attention span of the average person is about 30 seconds. Focusing attention has been compared to controlling a troop of wild monkeys. Attention craves novelty. 
It needs to be entertained and loves to leap from branch to branch making new connections. If there is nothing fresh and exciting for it to focus on, it becomes distracted and wanders off in search of something more compelling, uh, deadlines, football or world peace. Try this. Look away and fix your attention on anything that isn't moving. A great piece of art doesn't count. Keep your eyes on the object for 30 seconds. You'll probably feel your eyes glazing over after just 10 seconds, if not before. In face-to-face -face communication, it's not enough to command the other person's attention. You must also be able to hold on to it long enough to deliver your message or intention. You'll capture attention with your likability, but you'll hold on to it with the quality of the rapport you establish. More and more, it comes down to three things. One, your presence, or what you look like and how you move. Two, your attitude, that is, what you say and how you say it and how interesting you are. And three, how you make people feel. When you learn how to make fast, meaningful connections with people, you will improve your relationships at work and even at home. You'll discover the enjoyment of being able to approach anyone with confidence and sincerity. But a word of caution. We're not about to change your personality. This is not a new way of being, not a new way of life. You're not getting a magic wand to run out into the street and have the world inviting you to dinner. These are connecting skills to be used only when you need them. Establishing rapport in 90 seconds or less with another person or a group, be it in a social or community setting, with a business audience or even a packed courtroom, can be intimidating for many people. It's always amazed me that in this most fundamental of all life skills, we've been given little or no training. You're about to discover that you already possess many of the abilities needed for making natural connections with other people. It's just that you were never aware of many of them until now. Chapter 2, First Impressions For the purposes of this audiobook, there are three parts to connecting with other people. Meeting, establishing rapport, and communicating. These three parts happen quickly and tend to overlap and blend into each other. Our goal is to make them as natural, fluid, and easy as possible, and above all, to make them enjoyable and rewarding. Obviously, you begin the connecting process by meeting people. Sometimes you meet someone by chance, the woman on the train who turns out to share your passion for Bogart movies, and sometimes it's by choice. The man your cousin introduced you to because he loves Shakespeare, fine wines, and bungee jumping, just like you. If meeting is the physical coming together of two or more people, then communicating is what we do from the moment we are fully aware of another's presence. And between these two events, meeting and communicating, lies the 90-second land of rapport that links them together. The meeting. If you make the right impression during the first three or four seconds of a new meeting, you create an awareness that you are sincere, safe and trustworthy, and the opportunity to go further and create rapport will present itself. The greeting. We call the first few seconds of contact the greeting. Greetings are broken into five parts. Open, I, beam, high and lean. These five actions constitute a welcoming program to carry out in a first encounter. Open. The first part of the greeting is to open your attitude and your body language. For this to work successfully, you must have already decided on a positive attitude that's right for you. This is the time to really feel and be aware of it. Check to see that your body language is open. If you have the right attitude, this should take care of itself. Keep your heart aimed directly at the person you're meeting. Don't cover your heart with your hands or your arms and, when possible, unbutton your jacket or coat. I. The second part of the greeting involves your eyes. Be first with the eye contact. Look this new person directly in the eye. Let your eyes reflect your positive attitude. To state the obvious, eye contact is real contact. Get used to really looking at other people's eyes. When you're watching TV one evening, note the eye color of as many people as possible and say the name of the color to yourself. The next day, do the same with every person you meet, looking him or her straight in the eye. Beam or smile. This part is closely related to eye contact. Beam. Be the first to smile. Let your smile reflect your attitude. Now, you've gained the other person's attention through your open body language, your eye contact, and your beaming smile. What that person is picking up subconsciously is an impression not of some grinning, gawking fool, 
though you may briefly feel you look that way, but of someone who is completely sincere. Hi. Whether it's hi or hello or even yo, say it with pleasing tonality and attach your own name to it. Hi, I'm Nick. As with the smile and the eye contact, be the first to identify yourself. It's at this point, and with only a few seconds, that you're in a position to gather tons of free information about the person you're meeting. Information that you can put to good use later in your conversation. Take the lead. Extend your hand to the other person, and if it's convenient, find a way to say his or her name two or three times to help fix it in memory. Not Glenda, 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 nice to meet you, but Glenda, great to meet you, Glenda. As you'll see in Chapter 7, this will be followed by your occasion location statement. Lean. The final part of introducing yourself is lean. This action can be an almost imperceptible forward tilt to very subtly indicate your interest and openness as you begin to synchronize the person you've just met. The handshake. Handshakes run the gamut from the strong, sturdy bone crusher to the wet noodle. Both are memorable, once shaken, twice shy in some cases. Certain expectations accompany a handshake. It should be firm and respectful, as if you were ringing a handbell for room service. Deviate from these expectations and the other person will scramble to make sense of what's happening. There is a feeling that something's wrong, like hot water coming out of the cold tap. The brain hates confusion, and when faced with it, the first instinct is to withdraw. The hands-free handshake is a handshake without the hand, and it's a powerful tool. Just do everything you do during a normal handshake, but without using your hand. Point your heart at the other person and say hello. Light up your eyes and smile, and give off the same special energy that usually accompanies the full-blown handshake. Incidentally, the hands-free handshake works wonders in presentations when you want to establish rapport with a group or audience. It has terrific energy to it. An exercise in greeting. Firing energy. This is one of the most powerful exercises we do in my seminars, but even without supervision you can turn it into a force to be reckoned with. Ideally you'll need a partner to work with. Stand about eight feet apart facing each other like two gunfighters in a cowboy movie. As you say hi, clap your hands together and slide your right hand off and pass the other in the direction of your partner. Gather up all the energy you can through your body and store it in your heart. Then clap the energy on through your right hand, the one you use in a handshake, straight into the other person's heart. This is a long explanation for something that takes no more than two seconds, but when all six channels, body, heart, eyes, smile, clap and voice and your breath are fired at the person in a rapid flash, there is a vast transfer of energy. Immediately after receiving the energy, your partner should fire it back at you in the same way. Continue, taking turns, firing energy at each other fast and focused. Be sure to make contact with all six channels at once. Practice on each other for two minutes. Now the real fun begins. You're going to start firing different qualities of energy. Logic or head energy, communication or throat energy, love or heart energy, power, solar plexus energy, and sexual energy. You've already fired love heart energy, that is, you've fired at the heart of the other person. Now do the same head to head instead of heart to heart. Keep firing head or logic energy at each other. Aim the energy from your clap at the other person's head until you both agree that you can feel and differentiate it from the love or heart energy. After two or three minutes back and forth, try the other regions. Fire energy from your throat to the other person's throat and then back. From your solar plexus to the other person's solar plexus and back. It gets even better. Figure out which kind of energy you want to send. Don't tell them what it is. Now greet your partner, shake hands, say hi and fire. Your partner must identify the kind of energy he or she is receiving, be it from the head, the heart, the solar plexus. Take turns. Practice and practice until your body language becomes subtle and almost imperceptible. Now go out and try it on the people you meet. Fire energy when you say hi to someone at a supermarket, or to your waiter in the cafe, to your sister-in-law, or the guy who fixes the photocopier in your office. They will notice something special about you. Some might call it star quality. Establishing rapport. Rapport is the establishment of common ground, of a comfort zone where two or more people can mentally join together. When you have rapport, each of you brings something to the interaction. Attentiveness, warmth, a sense of humor, for example. And each brings something back. Empathy, sympathy, maybe a couple of great jokes. 
Rapport is the lubricant that allows social exchanges to flow smoothly. The prize when you achieve rapport is the other person's positive acceptance. This response won't be in so many words, but it will signal something like this. I know I just met you, but I like you, so I will trust you with my attention. Sometimes rapport just happens all by itself, as if by chance. Sometimes you have to give it a hand. Get it right, and the communication can begin. Get it wrong, and you'll have to bargain for attention. As you meet and greet new people, your ability to establish rapport will depend on four things. Attitude, your ability to synchronize certain aspects of behavior like body language and voice tone, your conversation skills, and your ability to discover which sense, visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, the other person relies on most. Once you become adept in these four areas, you'll quickly be able to connect and establish rapport with anyone, anytime you choose. Keep listening and you'll discover that it's possible to speed up the process of feeling comfortable with a stranger by quantum leaping the usual familiarization rituals and going straight into the routines that people who like each other do naturally. In virtually no time at all, you'll be getting along as if you've known each other for ages. Many of my students report that when achieving rapport becomes second nature, they find people asking, are you sure we haven't met before? I know the feeling, it happens to me all the time. And it's not just people asking me the question. I'm convinced that half the people I meet, I've met before. That's the way it goes when you move easily into another person's map of the world. It's a wonderful feeling. Communicating. Everyone seems to have a different sense of the word communication. The definitions usually go something like this. It's an exchange of information between two or more people. It's getting your message across. It's being understood. In the early days of neuro-linguistic programming, that research project devoted to the study of excellence and modeling how individuals structure their subjective sensory experience, Richard Bandler and John Grinder created an effective definition. They said, the meaning of communication lies in the response it gets. This is simple and brilliant because it means it's 100% up to you whether or not your communication succeeds. After all, you're the one with the message to deliver or a goal to achieve, and you're the one with the responsibility to make it happen. What's more, if it doesn't work, you're the one with the flexibility to change what you do until you finally get what you want. In order to give some form and function to communication here, let's assume we have some kind of response or outcome in mind. People who are low on communication skills usually have not thought out the response they want from the other person in the first place, and therefore cannot aim for it. The skills you'll learn here will serve you on all levels of communication, from social dealings like developing new relationships and being understood in your daily interactions, all the way to life-changing moves for yourself and those in your sphere of influence. The formula for effective communication has three parts. Number one, know what you want. Formulate your intention in the affirmative and preferably in the present tense. For example, I want a successful relationship and I filled my imagination with what that relationship will look, sound, feel, smell and taste like with me in it and I know when I'll have it. It's an affirmative statement as opposed to I don't want to be lonely. Number two, Find out what you're getting. Get feedback. You find out that hanging out in smoky bars is not for you? Then, number three, change what you do till you get what you want. Design a plan and follow it through. I'll invite ten people over for dinner every Saturday night. Do it and get more feedback. Redesign if necessary and do it again with more feedback. Repeat the cycle. Redesign, do it, get feedback until you get what you want. You can apply the cycle to any area of your life that you want to improve. Finance, romance, sports, career, you name it. And so, know what you want, find out what you're getting, and change what you do till you get what you want. This is terrifically easy to remember because a certain colonel had the good sense to open a chain of restaurants using the abbreviation KFC. K, know what you want. F, find out what you're getting. And C, change what you do till you get what you want. What's coming up? In the following chapters, we'll examine the arena of rapport in much more detail, as well as the value of a really useful attitude in projecting an image of yourself. You'll learn what happens at first sight on the surface and below the surface, and the importance of having your body language, your voice tone, and your words be congruent or all saying the same thing. No cross signals, no mixed messages, no confusion.
You'll discover how your body language appeals to some but not to others and how by making a few adjustments to your own movements, you can positively affect the way people feel about you. Then we'll delve into the warm and welcoming world of synchrony. You'll learn how to align yourself with the signals other people send you so that they will feel a natural familiarity and comfort around you. We'll also discuss the massive importance of voice tone and how it influences the moods and emotions we want to convey. A whole chapter is devoted to starting and maintaining sparkling conversation. We'll explore all the ways to open people up and avoid closing them down. We'll also deal with compliments, obtaining free information and being memorable. And finally, we'll go even deeper, down to the very core of the human psyche. The astonishing truth is that although we navigate the world through our five senses, each of us has one sense that we rely on more than the other four. I'll show you how people are giving off clues about their favorite sense all the time and how you can move on to the same sensory wavelength as theirs. Do people who rely mainly on their ears differ from those who rely mainly on their eyes? Darn right they do. And you'll find out how to tailor your approach to communicate with them. Each chapter includes at least one exercise that will help you realize the power of connecting. Some of these exercises can be done alone, but others you have to do with a partner. Well, let's face it, face-to-face -face communication and rapport skills are interactive activities. You can't learn to do them all by yourself. So there it is, connecting. All day long, men, women and children give away the vital keys to what makes them tick, to how they experience and filter the world through their body language, their tone of voice, their eye movements and their choice of words. They simply can't help doing this. Now it's up to you to learn how to use this wonderful, non-stop, flood of information to achieve improved outcomes and more satisfying relationships. Part 2. The 92nd Land of Rapport. Chapter 3. There's something about this person I really like. Whether you're trying to make a sale, get a date, or wangle out of a traffic ticket, you need to establish rapport. Sometimes rapport just happens naturally, and you have no clue why. The job gets done, the conversation flows, the cop tears up the ticket. But how often have you found yourself in a situation where, no matter how hard you try, you just can't seem to connect with another person, and it makes no sense? After all, you know you're a fine, decent human being. Maybe you're even a fabulous, wildly attractive human being. But no matter what you say or do, you don't establish rapport and you can't connect. You're not alone. Being a decent sort is not enough to guarantee good rapport with another person. In the dictionary, rapport is defined as sympathetic communication. In our interpersonal communications, we go through certain routines when we first meet a new person. If these routines work out and rapport is established, we can begin to deliver our communication with some certainty it will be accepted and given serious consideration. Serious consideration is vital because the fundamental outcome of rapport is the perception of credibility, which in turn will lead to mutual trust. If credibility is not established, the messenger and not the message may become the focus of attention, and that attention will harbour discomfort. But when we experience the world through the same eyes, the same ears, and the same feelings as other people, we are so bonded or synchronized with them that they can't help but know we understand them. This means being so much like them that they trust and feel comfortable with us, that they say to themselves subconsciously, I don't know what it is about this person, but there's something I really like. Research has shown that we have approximately 90 seconds to make a favorable impression when we first meet someone. What happens in those 90 seconds can determine whether we succeed or fail in achieving rapport. In fact, frequently, we have much less than 90 seconds. Natural rapport. Attraction is present everywhere in the universe. Whether you want to call it magnetism, polarity, electricity, thought, intelligence, or charisma, it's still attraction and it invests everything, animal, vegetable, or mineral. We form synchronized partnerships naturally, and although they are hardly noticeable to some, they're quite tangible to others. We've always relied on emotional contact and signals from our parents, peers, teachers and friends to guide us through our lives. We are influenced by their emotional feedback, their gestures and their way of doing things. 
when your mother or father sat a certain way, you would do the same. If a cool friend or a movie star walks a certain way, you might find yourself adopting a similar gait. We learn by aligning ourselves with the signals other people send us. They impress their way of being on us, and we synchronize what we like about them. People with common interests have natural rapport. The reason you get along so well with your close friends is that you have similar interests, similar opinions, and maybe even similar ways of doing things. Sure, you'll often find plenty to differ on and argue about, but essentially, you're very much like each other. We human beings are social animals. We live in communities. It's far more normal and even logical for people to get along with one another than it is for them to argue, fight, and not get along. The irony, though, is that society has conditioned us to be slightly afraid of each other, to set up boundaries between ourselves and others. We live in a society that pretends to find its unity through love, but actually finds it through fear. The media scare us half to death with headlines and advertisements, continually telling us of earthquakes and airplane crashes, and asking us if we've got enough insurance, are we too fat, too thin, too old, too daft, too ugly? Does the smoke detector work? And what about those high funeral expenses? Natural rapport is a prime requirement for our sanity, our evolution, and indeed, our survival. Rapport by chance. Perhaps you've travelled abroad to a country where people don't speak your language and you don't understand theirs. You feel a little uncomfortable, even suspicious when you can't be understood. Then suddenly you meet someone from your own country, maybe your own state. This person speaks your language and whammo, you've got a new best friend, at least for your vacation. You might share experiences, opinions, insights, where to find the best restaurant and bargains. You will doubtless exchange personal information about family and work. All this and much more because you share a language. That's rapport by chance. Maybe your enthusiasm will lead you to continue that friendship after returning home, only to discover that apart from language and location, the two of you have nothing in common, and the relationship fizzles out all by itself. This isn't limited to language and geography. Chance encounters happen on almost a daily basis to all of us, at work, in the supermarket, at the laundromat, or at the bus stop. The key to establishing rapport with strangers is to learn how to become like them for a very short time. Fortunately, this is both very simple and a lot of fun to do. It also allows you to look on each new encounter as a game, a puzzle, a joy. Rapport by design. When the interests or the behavior of two or more people are synchronized, these people are said to be in rapport. As we already know, rapport can happen in response to a shared interest or when you find yourself in certain situations or circumstances. But when none of these conditions is present, there is a way to establish rapport by design. And that's what this book is about. Common ground. Mark is attending a formal dinner, eight to a table. He hates coming to these events and, as usual, is stuck for words. He's beginning to get that squirmy feeling. He doesn't know anyone except for his accountant who's sitting at the other end of the banquet hall and making everyone laugh. Suddenly, the guest across from him, a young woman in a shiny blue dress who caught his eye a few moments ago, even though they hadn't spoken, tells the man on her left that she is an avid stamp collector, just like Mark. Mark is relieved and overjoyed because chance has given him an excuse to talk to her. They have something in common, stamps. Mark speaks up and tells Tanya all about his rare 1948 poached egg stamp and how he found it when his car broke down in Cortlandville in Upper New York State. With both elbows on the edge of the table and a finger poised gently on her cheek close to her ear, Tanya leans toward Mark. Her pupils dilate slightly as her shoulders become softer and more relaxed. Mark too leans forward on his elbows, smiling as Tanya smiles, nodding as she nods. She sips her water. He finds himself doing the same. Mark and Tanya have established rapport. They connected and initiated a relationship through a common interest. They found common ground. The rapport is evident on many levels. The cues and rhythms they are taking from and sending to each other and the imperceptible modifications of behavior they are making without thinking. Their shared interest has given them proximity, and they are adjusting to one another. Who knows where it will lead? They like each other because they are like each other, and the dance of rapport has begun to calibrate itself. They have made a favorable connection in less than 90 seconds. 
When we set out to establish rapport by design, we purposely reduce the distance and differences between another person and ourselves by finding common ground. When this happens, we feel a natural connection with the person or persons because we are akin, we've become like each other. As rapport develops between Mark and Tanya in the story I just told, there's a lot more going on than meets the eye. The average person would perhaps not notice, but to the trained eye and ear there's plenty happening. As their shared interest in stamps emerges, so does a similarity in their behavior towards each other. Body language, facial expressions, tone of voice, eye contact, breathing patterns, body rhythms, and many more physiological activities come into alignment. Simply put, they unconsciously start to behave in a like manner. They start synchronizing their actions. Rapport by design is established by deliberately altering your behavior just for a short time in order to become like the other person. You become an adapter just long enough to establish a connection. Precisely what you can adapt and how you do it is what you're about to learn in the chapters that follow. All you'll need at your disposal is your attitude, your appearance, your body, your facial expressions, your eyes, the tone and rhythm of your voice, your talent for structuring words into engaging conversation, and your about-to-be-revealed gift for discovering another person's favorite sense. Add to this an ability to listen to and observe other people and a very large helping of curiosity. No gadgets, no appliances, no aphrodisiacs, no pills, no checkbook, no big stick. Just the wonderful gifts you were born with and your heartwarming desire for the company of other people. Chapter 4. Attitude is everything. Your mind and your body are part of the same system. They influence each other. When you're happy, you look happy. You sound happy and you use happy words. Try to be miserable while you jump in the air and clap your hands or try to be happy as you slouch in a chair and let your head droop. Your attitude controls your mind, and your mind delivers the body language. Attitude set the quality and mood of your thoughts, your voice tone, and your spoken words. Most importantly, they govern your facial and body language. Attitudes are like trays on which we serve ourselves up to other people. Once your mind is set into a particular attitude, you have very little ongoing conscious control over the signals your body sends out. Your body has a mind of its own, and it will play out the patterns of behavior associated with whatever attitude you find yourself experiencing. A really useful attitude. No matter what you do or where you live, the quality of your attitude determines the quality of your relationships, not to mention just about everything else in your life. I've been using the same bank branch for the last eight years. From time to time, someone I've never heard of before sends me a letter, spelling my name wrong, to tell me what a pleasure it is to have me as a special customer. No matter how hard they try to improve their personalized service, however, banks are pretty much the same all over, and my bank is really no different from the rest. So why do I still bank there, even though two new competing banks have recently opened much closer to where I live? Convenience? No. Better rates? Nope. It's none of these things. It's Joanne, one of the tellers. What does Joanne offer that the institution can't? She makes me feel good. I believe she cares about me, and other customers feel the same way about her. You can tell by the way they talk with her. This charming lady brightens up the whole place. How does Joanne do it? It's simple. She knows what she wants, to please the customers and do her job well. She has a really useful attitude, or to be more precise, two fully congruent, really useful attitudes. She is both cheery and interested and everybody benefits me the customer her colleagues her company no doubt her family and above all herself what joanne sends out with her really useful attitude comes back to her a thousandfold and becomes a joyous self-fulfilling reality and it doesn't cost a cent a really useless attitude any two people can have wildly different attitudes towards the same set of experiences However, when two people react to the same experience with the same attitude, they share a powerful natural bond. Attitudes have the tendency to be infectious, and because they are rooted in emotional interpretation of experiences, they can be distorted and shaped, they can be wound up or wound down. What happens when people lose control and become angry? They look belligerent with their body language, their voice tone is harsh, and they use menacing words. 
They can be very scary to be around from the point of view of making people like you or even getting willing cooperation. We call this a really useless attitude. How often have you seen infuriated parents berating their children for knocking over the bananas at the supermarket or bored, uninterested shop assistants or cranky, impatient doctors? They're all putting out useless attitudes. I'm not saying whether this is right or wrong. I'm just pointing out that from a communication standpoint, it doesn't deliver the message very well, assuming they have a message. And that's often the point. Useless attitudes tend to come from people who don't know what they really want from their communication. Remember the K in KFC? It stands for know what you want. If you don't know what you want, there's no message to deliver and no basis for connecting with other people. Most people think in terms of what they don't want as opposed to what they do want, and their attitudes reflect this. I don't want my boss yelling at me anymore comes with a whole different attitude than I want my boss's job, or I want to be promoted. In the same way, I'm sick of selling neckties all day long sends a completely different attitude and set of signals to your imagination than does I want to run a charter fishing boat in Honey Harbour. Your imagination is the strongest force you possess stronger than willpower. Think about it. Your imagination projects sensory experiences in your mind through the language of pictures, sounds, feelings, smells and tastes. Your imagination distorts reality. It can work for you or against you. It can make you feel terrific or make you feel miserable. So the better the information you can feed into your imagination, the better it can organize your thinking and your attitudes and ultimately your life. It's your choice. The good news is that attitudes are yours to select. And if you're free to choose anyone you please, why not choose a really useful attitude? Let's say you just flew into Miami International Airport and you missed your connection for Omaha. You simply have to get on the next flight at all costs. So you go up to the airline desk and shout at the representative. This is really a useless attitude. If what you want is to get the attendant's maximum help, the best thing you can do is find a really useful attitude that will create rapport and get his cooperation. I'll probably regret saying this, but I've talked my way out of dozens of car-related tickets. I've also failed a few times, and not just for parking infractions. I'm absolutely convinced that if I'd started by telling the officer his radar was off or by losing my temper or getting angry and telling him I'm the mayor's cousin and I'll never visit his town again, I'd be doomed from the start. If what I want is for the officer to like me, to be understanding and not give me a ticket, then I have to assume a really useful attitude like, I'm sorry, or fair enough, or, or what a fool I am, or, or wow, yeah, thanks for telling me that. The last time I got stopped, the officer followed me into the village supermarket parking lot and pulled to a stop across the back of my car. I got out and walked to his car. From his physical appearance, with his beard and body set, I figured he was a kinesthetic or a feeling-based person. You'll learn more about this later. So the first words out of my mouth were, fair and square. That's because there was no doubt I was in the wrong. He gave me a well-deserved speech about what I'd done and let me off with a warning. The point is that my attitude set the tone for the encounter, because I knew what I wanted. In face-to-face -face situations, your attitude proceeds to really you like when you meet someone for the first time, you can be curious or enthusiastic, inquiring, helpful or engaging, or my favorite, warm. There's something intoxicating about warm human contact. In fact, scientists have discovered that it can generate the release of opiates in the brain. How about that for a really useful attitude? Needless to say, a really useful attitude is more useful than revenge and disrespect. An exercise in attitude. Triggering happy memories. You know how certain sounds can remind you of something special in your life? When I was eight, my mother took me to a resort where I stood next to a man making fresh donuts while Paul Anker sang Diana in the background. Now, whenever I hear this song, it triggers the smell of fresh donuts and the memory of that happy holiday. It's the song that triggers the memory. A trigger can be a sound or something visual. It can also be a feeling or action. And believe it or not, it can be as simple as a clenched fist. Follow these steps and you'll see what I mean. Use the hand you write with and clench your fist tightly. Then release it. Repeat the action a couple of times. This clenched fist will be your trigger. Now release it. To start with, pick a really useful attitude. One that you know will be useful when you first meet someone. It could be warm, confident, relaxed, obliging, curious, helpful, engaging, laid back, patient, welcoming, interested, Whatever suits you. 
but it must be one that you've experienced at some time in your life and can recall on demand. Find a comfortable spot, quiet and not too bright, where you won't be disturbed for a few minutes. Sit down, place both your feet on the floor, and breathe slowly into your abdomen, not your chest, and relax. Now you're ready. Close your eyes and picture a time in your life when you felt the attitude you've chosen. In your mind's eye, make a picture of the specific event. Put in all the detail you can remember. What was in the foreground and the background? Is the picture sharp? Is it fuzzy? Is it black and white or color? Is it large or small? Take your time. Make it as real as you can. That's right. Now step into that picture and look out through your own eyes and take note of what you see. That's good. Now, bring up the sounds associated with this picture. Notice where the sounds come from. Are they from the left or the right, in front or behind? How loud or soft are they? What kind of sounds are they? Music, voices? Listen to the tone and volume and rhythm. Listen deeply and the sounds will come flooding back. Listen to the quality of each sound and try to hear how it contributes to your chosen attitude. Now bring up the physical sensations associated with this event. The feeling of the things around you, the air temperature, your clothing, your hair, what you are standing or sitting on. Notice the feelings inside your body. Where do they begin? Perhaps they move around inside your body. Move your concentration deep into these wonderful feelings and enjoy them. Ride with them. Notice any smells and tastes that want to be included and savor them as well. Now, although your outside eyes are still closed, look out through your inside eyes again at the scene. Make the picture sharper and brighter and bolder and bigger. Make the sounds stronger, clearer, purer, more perfect. Make the feelings richer, stronger, deeper, warmer. Follow the intensity of the feelings as they move from one place to another. Then loop them back to the beginning and intensify them. Loop them over and over as they get stronger and stronger. Let the feeling flood all over you. Make everything twice as big and strong and pure. Then double it again and again. Now your whole body and mind are luxuriating in the experience of it all. Seeing it, hearing it, feeling it. Make the sensations as strong as you can. And just when you can't make them any stronger, double them one more time and clench your fist hard and fast as you anchor the height of the experience to your trigger. Clench your fist. Feel the sensations pour through you. Intensify them again. Then clench your fist at the height of the feelings and release it. Relax your hand and feel the sensations pour through your body. That's right. Now clench your fist one more time. Clench your fist tight and let it go and feel the sensation pour through your body. Ride with the feeling. Now come down in your own time and relax. Come back into the room, open your eyes and relax. Breathe gently. Now wait a minute or so, then test your trigger. As you make a tight fist, notice the feelings rush into all your senses. Test it again after a couple of minutes. You're now ready to trigger this really useful attitude whenever you want. Ask yourself, what do I want right now at this moment and which attitude will serve me best? Remember, there are only two types of attitude to consider when you're dealing with fellow humans, useful and useless. How many times have you seen a newsmaker give a TV interview when she's frustrated? Or a salesperson serve you in a store when he clearly wishes he was somewhere else? A colleague who's sarcastic to the very person who can get the photocopying done faster if they want to. Or passengers being rude to the cab driver who's the only person with the means to get into the church on time. These are all really useless attitudes. As far as communication is concerned, they are virtually guaranteed to fail. A really useful attitude is one of the major delivery vehicles of your likability factor. And it works like a charm. Your posture, your movements, your expressions will speak volumes about you before you even open your mouth. The sooner you know what you want and which is the most useful attitude to help you get it, the sooner your body language and your voice and your words will change to help you get it. The conclusion is obvious. People who know what they want tend to get it because they're focused and positive, And this is reflected outward and inward in their attitude. Take on a cheery attitude the next time you meet someone new and see how your whole being changes to the part. Your look will be cheery, you'll sound cheery and you'll use cheery words. This is the full communication package. 
Other people make major adjustments in their responses to you based on the signals you transmit. The next chapter will take a detailed look at how these signals combine to present a positive image. Chapter 5. Actions do speak louder than words. First impressions are powerful. Along with the instinctive fight-or-flight appraisals, we're also weighing the opportunities involved in almost every new face-to-face -face encounter. No matter how hard we try, we cannot get away from the fact that image and appearance are important when meeting someone for the first time. Dressing well goes a long way to making a positive impression as you begin to establish rapport. But how do you make people warm to you? And how do you project the likable parts of your own unique personality? Body language. Your body language, which includes your posture, your expressions and your gestures, accounts for more than one half of what other people respond to and make assumptions about. When people think of body language, they tend to think it means what happens from the neck down. But much of what we communicate to others, and what they make assumptions about, comes from the neck up. Facial gestures and nods and tilts of the head have a vocabulary that equals or exceeds that of the body from the neck down. The signals we send with our bodies are rich with meaning and global in their scope. Some of them are hardwired into us at birth, and others are picked up from our society and our culture. Everywhere on the planet, panic induces an uncontrollable shielding of the heart with the hands and or a freezing of the limbs. A smile is a smile on all continents, while sadness is displayed through downturned lips as often in New York as in Papua New Guinea. The clenched fist of determination and the open palms of truth convey the same message in Iceland as they do in Indonesia. And, no matter where on earth you find yourself, mothers and fathers instinctively cradle their babies with the head against the left side of their body, close to the heart. And the heart is at the heart of it all. Facial expressions and body language are all obedient to the greater purpose of helping your body maintain the well-being of its center of feeling, mood and emotion, your heart. Volumes have been written about body language. But when all is said and done, this form of communication can be broken down into two rather broad categories, open and closed. Open body language exposes the heart, while closed body language defends or protects it. In establishing rapport, we can also think in terms of inclusive gestures and non-inclusive gestures. Open body language. Open body language exposes the heart and signals cooperation, agreement, willingness, enthusiasm, and approval. These gestures are meant to be seen, they show trust, and they say, yes. Your body doesn't know how to lie. Unconsciously, with no directions from you, it transmits your thoughts and feelings in a language of its own to the bodies of other people, and these bodies understand the language perfectly. Any contradictions in the language can interrupt the development of rapport. In his classic work, How to Read a Person Like a Book, Gerard Nirenberg explains the value of open gestures. These gestures include open hands and uncrossed arms, as well as the occasional subtle movements towards the other person that say, I'm with you, and shows acceptance. An open coat or jacket, for example, both literally and symbolically exposes the heart. When used together, such gestures say, things are going well. Positive, open body gestures reach out to others. These gestures are generally slow and deliberate. When an open person makes contact with the heart of another person, a strong connection is made and trust becomes possible. You know the feeling of a good hug or a heart-to-heart -heart talk. So, when you meet someone new, immediately point your heart warmly at that person's heart. There is absolute magic in this. Other common open gestures include standing with your hands on your hips and your feet apart, a stance that shows enthusiasm and willingness, or moving forward in your chair. Leaning forward shows interest and uncrossing your arms and legs signals you are open to suggestions. Closed body language. Defensiveness is shown through gestures that protect the body and defend the heart. These gestures suggest resistance, frustration, anxiety, stubbornness, nervousness, and impatience. They are negative gestures and they say no. Crossed arms are common to all manifestations of defensiveness. They hide the heart and defend one's feelings. Although you can be relatively relaxed with your arms crossed, the difference between a relaxed crossed arm position and a defensive crossed arms position is the accompanying gestures. For example, are your arms loosely folded or pressed close to your body? 
Are your hands clenched or open? Defensive gestures are often fast and evasive and beyond your conscious control. Your body has a mind of its own and is ruled by your attitude, useful or useless. In addition to crossed arms, the most obvious defensive gestures are avoiding eye contact with the other person and turning your body sideways. Fidgeting is another negative gesture which can also show impatience or nervousness. Right away, you can see the difference between a person who faces you squarely and honestly and someone who stands sideways to you with crossed arms and hunched shoulders while the two of you talk. In the first instance, the person is openly pointing his heart directly at your heart. In the second, the posture is defensive. The person is pointing his heart away from you and protecting it. One is being open with you, the other closed. Being in the presence of these two postures produces very different feelings. Smaller gestures. Hand gestures are also part of the vocabulary of body language. They too can be divided into open, positive responses, and closed or concealed gestures, negative responses, except that their range is far more intricate and expressive. I should point out that individual gestures, just like the individual words on this page, don't say much. Only when you're presented with more than one gesture, perhaps combined with an expression and topped off with some overall body language, can you deduce that a particular clenched fist means, wow, my horse came in first and not, I'm so mad I want to slap him. A similar set of differences occurs in body language above the neck. The open face smiles, makes eye contact, gives feedback, shows curiosity, and raises the eyebrows to show interest. In a casual encounter, a quick look and a lowering of the eyes says, I trust you, I'm not afraid of you. A prolonged look strengthens the positive signal. In conversation, we may use a nod of the head at the end of a statement to indicate that an answer is expected. In contrast, the closed face frowns, purses the lips and avoids eye contact. Frequently, I look around at my audiences and recognize people who've heard me talk before. I recognize them because they have the look of recognition on their face when they see me. It's a look or even an attitude of silent anticipation that at any minute I'll recognize them. Well, this look can work wonders from time to time with people you haven't met before. If you're on your own, try it out right now. Let your mouth open slightly in a smile as your eyebrows arch and your head tilts back a little with anticipation as you look directly at an imaginary person. A variation is to tilt your head as you look slightly away and then look back at the person with a bare minimum of a frown and, and maybe pursed lips. Practice, then give it a try. Be as subtle as you possibly can. Here's what I mean. Last spring, I rented a bus for my daughter and her friends to be chauffeured around in on the night of their prom. While I was paying at the rental office, I noticed a woman sitting at the next desk over. She had a look on her face that she knew me, and I racked my brain to place her, and I couldn't. In the end, I had to say, I'm sorry, but, but have we met before? No, she replied, then stood up and held out her hand to me and smiled and said, Hi, I'm Natalie. I had been obliged to speak first, and she had done the polite thing. She stood up, offered a hand, and introduced herself, all completely innocent. Or was it? I have no idea, but we had rapport, and she had me talking. Flirting. Classic flirting behavior involves letting someone know you like him or her, and that you'd like to pursue it further. Not surprisingly, body language plays a huge part in this game, and even less surprisingly, so does eye contact. Dozens of little gestures are used to send out sexual messages. The tilt of the head, holding eye contact a little longer than normal, the angle of the hips, the hands through the hair. Glancing sideways is a gesture that can suggest doubt when used on its own, but combine it with a slight smile and a narrowing of the eyes, and it's a powerful gesture of flirtation. A man sends out signals with his swagger, a woman by rolling her hips. A man loosens his tie ever so slightly, a woman moistens her lips. On and on, the parties convey their interest in each other through their stances, glances and postures until some small gesture synchronizes and sends out the OK. Congruity. Why do we like great actors and take them seriously when we know they're only speaking lines that someone else wrote? because they're believable, because they are congruent. In 1967, Professor Albert Morabian, the then Professor Emeritus of Psychology at UCLA, carried out the most widely quoted study on communication. He determined that believability depends on the consistency or congruity of three aspects of communication. In a paper titled Decoding of Inconsistent Communication, he reported the percentages of a message expressed through our different communication channels in this way. Interestingly, 55% of what we respond to takes place visually. 38% of what we respond to is the sound of communication. And just 7% of what we respond to involves the actual words we use. 
The professor called these the three V's of communication, the visual, the vocal, and the verbal. And to be believable, they must all give out the same message. This is at the very foundation of rapport by design. Over one half of all communication is nonverbal. It is the look of the communication, our body language that counts the most, the way we act, dress, the way we move, gesture, and so on. Need proof? Think of the last time you were with someone who stood with her arms crossed, tapping her foot and looking annoyed, and then huffed the words, I'm fine. Which clues did you believe, the words or the body language and the tone of voice? Physical messages often send out a much louder message than spoken words. Since 55% of your communication occurs as body language, see how easy it is, whether consciously or not, to either signal openness or defensive to another person by means of your body language. Gestures, rather than words, are the true indicators of your instinctive reactions. If you want others to believe that you can be trusted, you must be congruent. Your spoken language and your body language must say the same thing. If they don't, the other person's body will signal its discomfort to your body. In response to this communication, your body will signal to your brain by mixing up a chemical cocktail that corresponds to the discomfort that the other person is feeling. Then you'll both be uncomfortable and rapport will be that much harder to achieve. When they notice a discrepancy between your words and gestures, other people will believe the gestures and react accordingly. Mixed messages. Rosa, a waitress, folds up the ad she's torn from a newspaper, clears off the table where her new computer will sit, and leaves her apartment. At the electronic store, as Rosa hovers over the latest desktop model from Megahype, a young salesman notices the ad in her hand and wanders over to her. He unbuttons his jacket, spreads his hands out, slightly palms up, and looks her in the eye. I see you found it already, he says with a smile. Hi, my name's Tony. For the next ten minutes, a relaxed and sincere Tony talks to Rosa. He faces her with his hands exposed and leans forward from time to time as they discuss the features of the computer. Rosa listens with interest, her head tilted to one side and a hand on her cheek, as Tony offers to throw in $95 of extras and even agrees to eat the tax. Finally, stroking her chin as she forms a decision, Rosa nods, yeah, she says, this is the model for me. Great, says Tony, eagerly rubbing his palms together. It'll take about five minutes to take it down and find some boxes. Rosa looks sideways at him in France. You don't have a new one in a box? Well, that might be hard to find right now. Tony's hands become fists and he pops them into his pockets. They're such an unbelievable deal, they've just been flying out of the store. He buttons up his jacket, shrugs his shoulders and laughs nervously. Oh, so this is a demonstration model, Rosa tilts her head inquiring. Just came on the floor this morning, Tony shoots back with an insincere smile. He folds his arms in front of his chest and turns himself sideways to her, pretending to be distracted by something going on in the TV department nearby. His voice falters and weakens as he says, It has the same warranty as a new one. Rosa rubs the side of her nose in doubt. Came on the floor this morning. Fine. Can I have that in writing? Tony's back is turned to her as he leans over the monitor fiddling with the cables. Any excuse not to look at her. He catches a glimpse of himself in one of the wall mirrors. Oh boy, what an idiot I am, he thinks. He bites his lip and turns back to face Rosa. But Rosa's gone. As a good waitress, Rosa's used to reading body language. She saw that the salesman's gestures conflicted or lacked congruity with his words, and she knew that she should believe the gestures. The change in Tony's voice tone from informing to pleading just served to confirm her feelings of doubt. So, congruity occurs when your body voice, tone, and words are all in alignment. And when your body, tone, and words are communicating the same thing, you will appear sincere and people will tend to believe you. This is why a really useful attitude is so important. Appearing sincere or congruent is a key ingredient for building the trust that opens the door to likability and rapport. Make sure that your words, your voice, tone, and your gestures are all saying the same thing. Be on the lookout for incongruity in others. Notice how it makes you feel. We've all seen those old movies where a couple of people are driving along in a car and they're rocking the steering wheel even though the background shows that the road is straight as an arrow. It's phony. You know they're really in a studio being bounced around in a box. Your senses have told you that something isn't right. Something is out of alignment. And so you can't believe what you see. 
Or have you ever had someone get mad at you and then in the middle of bawling you out flash a sinister little smile that disappears as fast as it came? It's very chilling. This is another example of incongruent behaviour. The smile doesn't belong with the anger. And so it appears insincere. Recognising incongruent behaviour is another survival instinct. If you're on vacation and you're approached by a complete stranger who grins at you whilst he rubs his hands briskly together, licks his lips and says, Good morning, how would you like to invest in the world's best timeshare deal? The chances are you'll be on your guard. A quick congruence check is instinctive and there's another reason why first impressions are paramount. Frequently, a person's emotions and intentions are misunderstood by those around them. For instance, a woman at one of my seminars discovered that she unconsciously used a tone of voice that was incongruent with her words. No, I'm not confused. I'm interested, she would insist when tested. And again, no, I'm not sad. I'm relaxed. This went on and on until she came to the verge of tears and said, now I know why my kids are always saying, Mom, how come you get mad at us all the time? And I'm not mad at them. Sometimes I'm just excited. The same woman also told us that her co-workers accused her of sarcasm, but that to her nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, sarcasm is simply words said with conflicting voice tone. It's structured so that the person on the receiving end will believe what's inferred by the tonality and not the words. Suppose you let your team down and somebody's heard to quip, that was brilliant, with a tonality that communicates annoyance. It's a very different case when you score a fantastic goal and the same person is heard to say with excitement, that was brilliant. An exercise in congruity. Words versus tone. Say each of the following phrases with different tonality with anger, then boredom, surprise, and flirtatiousness. Notice how your body language, facial expressions, and breathing combine to alter your emotional state. I'll do the first one. It's late. If I say it with anger, it's late. With boredom, it's late. Surprise, it's late. Flirtatiousness, it's late. Here are three more for you to try. I've had enough. Look at me, and where were you born? To check your tonality, find a friend and say one or two of these phrases. See if your friend can tell you which of the four feelings you're expressing. If it's not obvious, keep working at it until it is clear. Congruity then has one unshakable rule, and it's this. If your gestures, your voice tone, and your words do not say the same thing, people will believe the gestures. Go up to someone you know, shake your head from side to side as if to say no and say, I really like you. Ask them what they think. Even better, go find a mirror and try it. I think you get my point. Your gestures are a giveaway to what you really mean. Being yourself. Do you feel nervous when you meet someone new? Physiologically, being nervous and being excited have a lot in common. Pounding heart, churning tummy, high chest breathing and the general jitters. While one of these states might send you hightailing it for the nearest dark corner, the other can serve you well and propel you forward. There is a tendency for panic to accompany nervousness, and this quite naturally makes bodily activities speed up. Because much of your nervousness stems from increased awareness, try redirecting some of your awareness towards slowing down and being more deliberate. One great technique is to imagine that your nostrils are just below your navel and that your in and out breaths are happening down there. The slower you are within reason, the more in control you'll appear. The sooner you start telling yourself that you're excited rather than nervous, the sooner you'll be able to convince your subconscious that this is actually how you feel. And in fact, that's really all that matters. Change your attitude and your body language and voice tone will change to reflect your new attitude. Keep in mind that most people are as eager as you are to establish rapport and they will generously give you the benefit of the doubt. Don't try too hard. In a study conducted at Princeton University, students of both sexes were questioned about their methods of sizing up people they met for the first time. Over-eagerness was one of the most reported turn-offs. Don't smile too hard, don't try to be too witty, don't be over-polite and avoid the temptation to be patronizing. As you become more at ease with your attitude, people will begin to notice characteristics that are unique to you, that set you apart from others and define you as an individual. You'll naturally and easily project the likable parts of your own unique personality and have more conscious control and confidence in your ability to create rapport at will.
It's just about impossible to be incongruent when you're operating from inside any kind of attitude, useful or otherwise, because your attitude precedes you. It is an essential component of the first impression you make on new acquaintances. Chapter 6. People like people like themselves. My neighbor down the road loves to fish. So do his two sons, who, by the way, look like their dad and walk like him. What a bond. I don't fish, and neither do any of my five children, but we share the same sense of humor. <laughs> what a relief. My aunt in Scotland is a medical doctor, and so is her daughter. They think alike. Another coincidence? The plumber in our village comes from three generations of plumbers. The woman who sold me a big ripe Gouda cheese at the Wednesday farmer's market in Leiden, just outside Amsterdam, had her mother and her daughter working for her, all dressed the same. What's going on here? Is there some kind of pattern emerging? How come they're so much alike? They've all grown up with harmonious behavior on many levels, physical and mental. They have synchrony. Since he was only three years old, my neighbor's youngest son has handled a fishing rod with great respect, just like his dad. He sits a certain way, just like his dad, and when he's threading the hook, he glances at his father from moment to moment to see if he's doing it correctly. A certain almost imperceptible expression says, continue, while another says, be careful, and yet another says, oh, you've got it wrong. The boy uses his own instincts to learn from his father, along with very subtle guidance from his father's expressions and body language, and at times his gentle, encouraging voice. Now he can do it, just like his dad. Natural synchrony. We learn our life skills through guidance and rapport with others. As we continually pick up signals from our parents, our peers, teachers, coaches, the television, movies, and our environment, our behavior is modulated and organized by synchronizing ourselves with the conduct of others and adjusting to their emotional feedback. Unwittingly, we've been synchronizing ourselves with other people since birth. A baby's body rhythms are synchronized with those of its mother. An infant's mood is influenced by his father's mood. A child's favorite toys are selected to keep pace with her peers. A teen's tastes must conform to what's cool. And an adult's preferences are influenced by mate, friends, and the community. All day long, we synchronize ourselves with those around us. We do it all the time. We thrive on it. We can't exist without it. We are always influencing each other's behavior. Every moment we are with other people, we make minute adjustments to our behavior and they to ours. This is what synchrony is all about. We process the signals unconsciously and transmit them to each other through our emotions. It's how we draw our strength and convictions. It's how we feel safe. It's how we evolve. And it's why people like, trust, and feel comfortable with people who are just like them. People hire people like themselves, people buy from people like themselves, people date people like themselves, people lend money to people like themselves, and so on, ad infinitum. Perhaps you've noticed that you take to some people immediately on meeting them for the first time, and yet feel no rapport at all with other new people. Or you might even feel an instant dislike for some people. This is something we've all experienced, but have you ever stopped to wonder why this happens? Why is it that with certain people you feel the natural trust and comfort that comes with rapport? Think back over the last week to some of the people you've met in your adventures. Go over the meetings in your mind and relive them. What was it about the people you liked that made you like them? Chances are you shared something. Interests or attitudes or ways of moving. People who get on well together usually have things in common. Those who share similar ideas, have the same taste in music or food or read similar books, or like the same holidays, hobbies, sports, vacations, will feel immediately comfortable with one another and like each other better than those who have nothing in common. In my workshops, I go over to a large blackboard and write, I like you. Then I add the tiny two-letter word am between the first and second words of that great phrase, so it reads, I am like you. The fact is that we like people who are like us. We are at ease with people who feel familiar. Where do you think the word familiar comes from? Look to your close friends. The reason you get along so well with them is that you have similar opinions, maybe even similar ways of doing things. Sure, you'll often find plenty to differ on and argue about, but essentially, you'll like each other. People with similar interests have natural rapport. If you share an interest in motorsports with one of the guys at the office, this can become a basis for rapport. Or perhaps you have two toddlers and go to the park every afternoon to meet up with other mothers in the same circumstances. This, again, is a basis for rapport. 
You've heard the saying, birds of a feather flock together. Well, quite simply, people are comfortable when they're surrounded by people like themselves. Rapport by chance holds true, not just on the surface, but underneath as well. Shared belief, appearances, tastes, and circumstance all contribute to rapport. Perhaps you feel comfortable around people with fluent, expressive voices, or sensitive people who speak softly and slowly. Maybe you enjoy the company of people who share their feelings when they communicate, or those who get straight to the point and don't mince their words. When you establish rapport by chance, you've come across someone who grew up with or developed a style similar to your own. The art of synchronizing. But why wait for rapport to happen naturally? Why not go straight into synchronizing other people's behavior as soon as you meet them? Why not invest 90 seconds or less of your time to establish rapport by design? Look around any restaurant, coffee shop, mall, or other public place where people meet each other and look around to see which ones are in rapport and which ones aren't. The ones who have rapport sit together in the same way. Notice how they lean forward towards one another. Notice their leg and arm positions. Those in rapport are synchronized, almost like dancers. One picks up a cup, the other follows. One leans back, the other does the same. One talks softly, the other talks softly. The dance goes on. Body position, rhythm, tone of voice. Now look for those people who are clearly together, but not synchronized. And observe the differences. Which pairs appear to be having a better time? I recently gave a speech at an auditorium in London, and right there, about ten rows back, was a beautiful couple, both immaculately dressed, with great attention to colour and detail. When I noticed them, they were sitting in the identical position, leaning to the right, with their hands folded close to their respective armrests. Then, as if responding to a prearranged signal, they both transferred their weight onto the other armrest, like synchronised swimmers, nodding and smiling in unison. They confirmed everything I was saying. I caught up with them afterwards and learned they'd been married for 47 years. They were fit, healthy, happy, and totally synchronized. Our goal, then, is to discover the structure of synchrony and modify it to apply to the different types of people we meet. The key to establishing rapport is learning how to synchronize what Professor Moravian called the three V's of consistent human communication. The visual, what it looks like, the vocal, how it sounds, and the verbal, the words we use, in order to connect with other people by becoming as much like them as possible for 90 seconds or less. You might say, does this mean I'm being phony or insincere? No. Remember, we're only talking about a minute and a half maximum. You're not being asked to engineer a total and permanent personality change. All you'll be doing is synchronizing another person to put him or her at ease and make them feel comfortable, and thus speed up what would happen naturally if you had more time. The idea is not to make your movements, tone and words obvious copies of the other person's, but rather to do the same kind of thing you do with a friend. Synchronizing skills are really nothing more than a connecting device to our greatest resource, other people. As we are instinctively drawn toward one another, be it to get cooperation or emotional feedback, or to have our physical needs met, synchronizing speeds up our mental unification. Often when you travel in a foreign country, the plug of your hairdryer or, or electric shaver won't fit into the outlet. You need an adapter to make it work, a connecting device that will let you plug the thing in and power it up. It's precisely the same thing when you plug into other people. Like the hairdryer or the electric shaver, you must have an adapter. So think of synchronizing as an adapting device that allows you to make smooth connections at will and quickly. Synchronizing is a way to make the other person become open, relaxed, and happy to be with you. You just do what they do. You become like them until the other person thinks, I don't know what it is about this person, but there's something I really like. You could think of synchronizing as rowing your boat alongside another person's rowboat, pointing it in the same direction at the same speed and picking up the other person's pace, stroke, breathing pattern, mood and point of view. As he rows, you row. As she rows, you row. One evening, a few years ago, I was sitting in the chalet of a ski club, waiting for my two youngest daughters to finish night skiing. Suddenly in walked a neighbor, a lawyer who'd been on polite nodding terms with my family. When I saw him arrive, I made up my mind to try out some simple synchronizing on him. I decided on the outcome I wanted, remember, know what you want, and that I would continue synchronizing until he made a definite gesture of friendship. 
I calmly stood up, and he spotted me. We met in the middle of the large room. Hi there, he said with a tight-lipped smile as he shook my hand. Matching the tone of his voice, his grimace, and his body stance, I echoed, Hi there. He placed one hand on his hip, and with the other pointed out of the chalet window, just waiting for my kids to finish. Me too, I said, mirroring his gestures. I'm waiting for my kids to finish. I synchronized him respectfully for less than 30 seconds of normal, innocent conversation. Then he suddenly blurted out, You know something? We really don't see enough of you and your family. Why don't you come by for dinner one night? We set the date right there and then. I could almost read what had happened by the way his mouth twisted. He was thinking, There's well, something about this guy I really like, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Obviously, if he felt I'd been copying him, he'd have never have issued the invitation. I had approached him with a really useful attitude of warmth that even though I was synchronizing him, I kept fairly close to the surface. I faced him, immediately took on his overall posture, and used similar gestures and facial expressions. The vocal part, his voice tone and speed, was easy to fall in with, and I used similar words. It sounds more complicated than it actually was. The whole thing only took a few seconds. It was fun, and it felt good. I really did want to get to know him better, and this seemed the perfect opportunity. I'm sure we both experienced the thrill that only people can generate in people, the thrill of making new connections. There's absolutely nothing in this world as exciting and rewarding as connecting and developing a rapport that can lead to a new friendship or relationship. The Bully Mr. Zabo, the owner of a large chain of supermarkets, is well known among the trades for his intimidating manner. One day, he summoned the product managers of three competitive nationally recognized brands to meet him at one of his outlets. He led the three product managers to the aisle in which their products were displayed and proceeded to scold them for what he perceived to be the disgraceful state of their product facing. As he waved his arms about, pointing out what was wrong, he raised and lowered his voice, occasionally pausing to stare at them individually and even jabbing one of them, Paul, on the shoulder with his finger. At the end of the tirade, two of the browbeaten individuals nodded and made excuses, which gave Mr. Zabo even more ammunition to use against them. Ever since Mr. Zabo had begun his rant, Paul had been skillfully synchronizing Mr. Zabo's mood and general mannerisms. When it came time for him to respond to the irate owner, he almost became Mr. Zabo, but in a completely non-threatening way. He used similar arm gestures, tonality, pauses and attitude, and he even jabbed Mr. Zabo on the shoulder as he said, you're absolutely right. As they talked back and forth for a minute or so, Paul calmed down his own gestures and Mr. Zabo followed. When they finished talking, Mr. Zabo put his arm around Paul's shoulder and led him to the end of the aisle. There he called one of the store staff and said to him, give this man any help he needs. Paul had successfully joined Mr. Zabo in his world and led him quickly, skillfully and respectfully to his own desired outcome. So what about difficult people? I'm often asked what you're supposed to do when you meet someone who's all bundled up with defensiveness, tight jaw, arms crossed defensively, or hands jammed into pockets, or the best way to handle a bully, or a shy person, or a complainer, or someone who's arrogant or overly aggressive. It's not the purpose of this audiobook to give detailed instructions on dealing with difficult people, but here are some guidelines. Rule number one when encountering a difficult person is to ask yourself this question. Do I really need to deal with this person? If the answer is no, then leave him or her alone. If the answer is yes, ask yourself what it is that you want. What is your desired outcome? Not what it is you don't want. Remember, KFC, know what you want. When synchronizing difficult people, it's vital that you do it in a non-threatening way. Once you've matched your body language and your voice tone with theirs, you can begin to lead them out of it. Unfold your arms, relax your shoulders, check to see if they follow your lead. If they don't, get back to the original position for a moment or so and try again. A word about shy people. Try to find out what they're interested in. Synchronize their body movements and voice tone and unhurriedly ask them lots of open-ended questions until you get a glimmer of enthusiasm. Take on their attitude, and then little by little lead them out of it. Lean or sit forward and see if they follow. If not, go back to where you were and synchronize any little thing you can. You'll be surprised at how well this works. When do I start synchronizing? Try not to let more than two or three seconds go by before you start. Remember the sequence in Chapter 2? Open eye beam, high lean, open, really useful attitude, open body language, point your heart at the person, eye, 
First with the eye contact, beam. First with the smile, hi, introduce yourself, and lean. Indicate interest as you start synchronizing. Anything that increases the common ground and reduces the distance between you and the other person is a good thing. And the quickest way to accomplish this is to synchronize as many of the other person's aspects as you can. Adopt the same attitude, make the same motions, and speak the same way. Doing what comes naturally. Dave was out looking for an anniversary present for his wife. He had whittled his thinking down to two ideas. It was either to be the very latest palm-top computer or a painting to hang in their breakfast room. From where Dave parked his car at the shopping mall, it was more convenient to visit the computer store first. Fortunately, it was mid-morning and the store wasn't too busy. Dave approached the counter, where a salesman in a dark suit was nodding and smiling. So far, so good. As the salesman started to explain the differences in all the latest models, he lifted his right leg up and plunked it on a low stool that was somewhere next to him. Then he leaned thoughtfully on his right knee and continued with his explanation. Suddenly Dave couldn't wait to get out of there. It wasn't that he lacked interest, it was just that the macho leg raised position was completely out of sync with his own posture and it made him feel uncomfortable. It was a completely different story at the art gallery. Dave stopped in front of a painting that took his fancy and adopted a contemplative stance. Weight on one leg, arms folded, but with one hand on his chin and a finger hooked around his lips. After maybe a minute, he became aware of somebody standing quietly next to him and heard a soft, supportive voice simply say, Nice, isn't it? Yes, it is, Dave replied in a pensive voice. Let me know if I can help you, said the lady to his side. She withdrew to another part of the gallery. Within five minutes, Dave had bought the painting. It seemed the natural thing to do. Dave felt comfortable just looking at the painting. The woman had slipped in beside him, taken on the same body language as his, and dropped into the same attitude. She had made a seamless connection by exercising perfect, effortless synchrony. 55% body language, 38% voice tone, and just 7% words, the three V's. Synchronizing attitude. Synchronizing attitude, or multiple congruity to give it its scientific name, takes into account location and mood. It's also frequently supportive as when a friend is challenged and you take a stand with him, or a parent deeply relates to a child's problem with a class assignment, or you share the exhilaration your partner feels over a promotion. When people go through things together, they will often be synchronized right down to primal sighs of despair or shouts of joy. Pick up on other people's feelings, synchronize their movements, their breathing patterns and expression, and you'll deeply identify with them and tune in to the overall mood suggested by their voice and reflect it back. Synchronizing body language. As you already know, body language accounts for 55% of face-to-face -face communication. It is the most obvious, easiest, and rewarding feature to synchronize on your way to rapport. If you get nothing else out of this book but the ability to synchronize other people's body language, you'll be miles ahead of where you were last month. Synchronizing body language falls into two loose groupings. Matching, which means doing the same thing as the other person. She moves her left hand, you move your left hand. And mirroring, which means, as it implies, moving as if you were watching the other person in a mirror. He moves his left hand, you move your right. Maybe you're thinking, well, won't other people notice that I'm copying their behavior? Actually, they won't, unless your copying is blatant. Remember, your movements must be subtle and respectful. If someone sticks a finger in his ear and you do the same, then yeah, he'll probably notice that. But when a person is focused on conversation, he or she will not pick up on subtle synchronizing. Synchronizing a particular gesture. Hand and arm movements are especially easy and natural to synchronize by matching and mirroring. Some folk raise their shoulders when they talk, others slightly move their hands around as they express themselves. Do whatever they do. If you find it uncomfortable at first, then go a little at a time until, with practice, you become an expert synchronizer. Just the fact that you're noticing these different types of gestures is a big step in the direction of making people like you in 90 seconds or less. Body posture. Overall body posture is known as the attitude of the body. It shows how people present themselves and is a good indicator of emotional state. That's why we sometimes refer to it as adopting a posture. When you can accurately adopt a person's posture, you can get a pretty fair idea of how he or she feels. Overall body movements. 
whether it's a job interview or striking up a conversation at the museum fundraiser, observe the person's overall body movements, then gently mirror or match them. If he has a leg crossed, then cross a leg. If he's leaning against the grand piano, do it. If she's sitting sideways on a banquette, sit sideways. If she's standing with her hands on her hips, do the same. Body movements like leaning, walking and turning are easily synchronized. Head tilts and nods. These are the simplest movements to synchronize. Fashion photographers know that most of the feel of a terrific cover shot comes from the innuendo created by subtle tilts and nods of the head. Sure, the face is important, but it's the angles that carry the message. Pay close attention to them. Most good physicians and therapists find that they synchronize tilts and nods without giving it a second thought. It says, I hear you, I see what you're saying, and I feel for you. Facial expressions. Along with tilts and nods, synchronized facial expressions show agreement and understanding. They come naturally. When he smiles at you, your natural inclination is to smile back. When she shows wide-eyed surprise, give it back to her. Look around at the next luncheon or dinner you attend and notice how those with the deepest rapport are doing it all the time. It's an easy and natural, surefire way to make someone like you. You can match the same amount and same style of eye contact. It may be fleeting or direct or coy. Whatever it is, pick up on it and return it in the same way. Breathing. Pay attention to breathing. Is it fast or slow? Is it high in the chest, low in the chest, or from the abdomen? You can usually tell how people are breathing by watching the shoulders or the folds in their clothing. Synchronizing their breathing can be soothing and comforting to them. I teach volunteers who sit with terminally ill cancer patients how to have rapport with those in their care. The first thing I stress is breathe in and out with them. Then when you speak, you're actually doing it on their out-breath, and this has a very calming effect. Rhythms. The same rule applies for anything rhythmic. If she taps her foot, tap your pencil. If he nods his head, pat your thigh. In the right circumstances and with judicious application, this works well as long as it's beyond conscious awareness. If not, the next sound you hear may just be the door slamming shut, or worse. Just use common sense and discretion. An exercise in synchrony. In and out of sync. For this exercise, you'll need two other people besides yourself. So you have A, B, and C. A does the actions, B synchronizes A's actions, and C tells them when to synchronize and when to break synchrony. Quite simply, standing, sitting, or walking, A and B converse casually about anything they want. B synchronizes A's actions. In other words, B does whatever A is doing. After about 30 seconds, C tells them to break synchrony so that B now stops synchronizing with A and starts to move their body in a very different way. After another 30 seconds, C tells them to synchronize again, to start synchronizing again. And this goes on for 30 seconds. After another 30 seconds, they break synchrony again. And then after 30 seconds, they synchronize again. Now, switch places with A or B. So we have a different A, B, and C. Keep rotating so that each one of you assumes a different role in the exercise. Compare notes at the end of each rotation. The comments will most likely be similar to these. When I broke synchronization, it was as if a huge wall had been erected between us. Or when we stopped synchronizing, the level of trust plummeted. You can try this out on your own. Synchronize someone for a couple of minutes, then deliberately mismatch his or her movements for one minute before getting back into synchrony again. Go in and out at will and notice the difference. It will be tangible. Leading. As an extension of the same exercise, we can try leading. When you're sitting and talking with a friend, one of you might cross a leg and the other might do the same without thinking. This means that one of you is following the other's lead, which is a sure sign that the two of you are in rapport. As you quickly become proficient at synchronizing, you can test to find out just how well your rapport is going. After three or four minutes, regardless of what has gone before, and without the other person being aware of what you're doing, make a subtle move that's independent of your synchronizing. Lean back or cross your arms and perhaps tilt your head. If the other person follows, then you're synchronized and have rapport, and the other person is now subconsciously following your lead. If you tilt your head, she tilts her head. If you cross your legs, he crosses his. Just change what you're doing, make a movement, alter your vocal tone, and observe whether the other person matches or mirrors you. This way you can check to see if you are in rapport. If the other person doesn't follow your lead, go back to synchronizing his or her movements for a few minutes 
and then try again until it works. Synchronizing voice. Voice tone accounts for 38% of face-to-face -face communication. It reflects how a person's feeling. In other words, his or her attitude. People who are confused will sound confused, and people with a curious attitude will sound curious. You can learn to synchronize these sounds. Tone. Notice the emotions conveyed by the tone of voice. Tune into these emotions, get a feel for them, and use the same tone. Volume. Does the other person speak in a quiet voice or a loud voice? The value of synchronizing volume is not so much in doing it, but more in what can happen if you don't do it. If you are naturally loud and excitable and you meet someone who is more soft-spoken and reserved, it goes without saying that the other person would feel much more at ease with someone who spoke in the same tender tones. Conversely, a jovial, backslapping loudmouth would surely find lots of common ground with someone who radiated a comparable degree of exuberance. Speed. Does the other person speak quickly or slowly? A thoughtful, slow-speaking individual can be completely unsettled or flummoxed by a speed talker, just as much as a slow, ponderous talker can drive a quick thinker to the point of distraction. Talking at the same speed as someone else makes as much sense as walking at the same speed. Pitch. Does the voice go up and down? Voice pitch is one way to change someone's energy level. When you raise pitch and volume, you become more excited. When you lower them, you become calmer, right down to the intimacy of a whisper. Rhythm. Is the voice flowing or disjointed? Some people have a melodic way of speaking, while others have a more pragmatic, methodical output. Words. There is yet one more powerful area we can synchronize, and that's in the use of a person's preferred words. We'll be covering this fascinating world in Chapter 9. Synchronizing allows you to deeply identify with other people and get a better understanding of where they're coming from. Practice synchronization in all your activities, whether you're in an interview, at a bus stop, dealing with your children, calming an unhappy customer, or talking to the teller at the bank, the flower seller, the barman at the pub. You're not likely to run out of partners. Make synchronizing a part of your life for the next few days until it becomes second nature. Part 3, The Secrets of Communication. Chapter 7, It's Not All Talk, It's Listening To. Well, this is it. You've just introduced yourself to someone new. You remember to open your body language and keep your body, voice, tone and words all saying the same thing. You are first with the eye contact, first with the smile. You introduced yourself and, miracle of miracles, three seconds have gone by and you can still remember the other person's name. You've begun synchronizing and you feel confident that rapport is building. But now what? It's conversation time. Conversation is one of the very significant ways to build rapport and forge the bonds of friendship. It comes in two equally important parts, talking and listening, or, as you'll soon see, asking questions and actively listening. You may have found yourself in a situation where you wanted to talk to someone but suddenly felt tongue-tied and self-conscious about doing so, or maybe you felt your stomach sink as you take your seat on an airplane next to some interesting-looking person and can't think of a way to start talking without feeling self-conscious. What will they think of me? Am I boring? Am I intruding? And most important, how shall I start? The idea is to get the other person talking and then find out what matters to him or her and synchronize yourself accordingly. This is the realm of small talk, the hunting ground for rapport. It's here that you'll search for common interests and other stepping stones to rapport. While big talk is serious stuff like nuclear disarmament and politics, small talk is everything else. Your personal website, renovating the bathroom, a speeding ticket, or the color of Cousin Marissa's new sports car. Stop talking and start asking. Conversation is how we open other people up to see what's inside, or to deliver a message, or both. And questions are the spark plugs of conversation. Be aware, however, that there are two kinds of questions, those that open people up and those that close them down. Questions work with incredible ease and the results are virtually guaranteed, so be sure that you know which is which. Here's the difference. 
Open questions request an explanation and thus require the other person to do the talking. Closed questions elicit a yes or a no response. The problem with closed questions is that once you've been given a response, you're back to where you started, and you'll have to think of another question to maintain conversation. How well do you know him? The very fact that your question is open will guarantee that you quickly receive free information from the other person. Use opening up words. Good conversation is like a leisurely game of tennis with the words being pitched backwards and forwards for as long as there's mutual interest. When the words go off the court, it's time to serve again. An open question is the equivalent of a well-aimed serve. Open questions begin with one of six conversation-generating words. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. These words invite an explanation, an opinion, or a feeling. How do you know that? Who told you? Where do you think the information came from? When did you come to that conclusion? Why should I be interested? What good do these words do? They assist us in establishing rapport and making connections because they oblige the other person to start talking and begin opening up. Here's an easy way to look at it. If you ask somebody, did you go to the store, you're going to get a yes or a no answer. That's a closed question, but an open question, which begins with who, what, why, where, when, or how, would say, how did you get to the store? Where was the store? When did you get to the store? Any of these words get the other person talking. You can boost these conversation generators by adding sensory-specific verbs, see, tell, and feel. Doing this, you're asking the person to go into his or her imagination and bring out something personal to show you. Where do you see yourself by this time next year? Tell me why you decided on Bali for your vacation. How do you feel about calamari? Avoid closing down words. These words will have you playing tennis all on your own against a brick wall. The opposite of opening up words are these interrogatives. Are you, do you, have you? In other words, any questioning forms of the verb to be, to have, or to do will close off your chances of rapport-inducing conversation. They elicit a one-word reply, yes or no. Then what? Then you have to ask another question. You're going nowhere. Are you sure? Yes. Do you come here often? No. Have you ever thought how wonderful it would be to drop everything and go bungee jumping in the middle of the afternoon? Yes. Realize that no matter how long and interesting you make your questions, if they begin with closing down words, you're going to end up with a one-word answer. Either yes or no. For one whole day, do nothing but answer questions with questions. For variety, ask only open questions, and sometimes closed questions. You'll soon get the idea. In fairness, closing down words do have their place. Police, customs officials, and certain other regulators of the people are taught to use them to get straight answers. However, I'd like to remind any of you who have had the pleasure of being on the receiving end of this type of conversation that it probably didn't make you like the person in 90 seconds or less. Chance Encounters there are times when you find yourself suddenly thrust into the presence of someone who's just too good to pass up. These delicious moments seem to coincide with the exact second that your brain freezes over and you go gaga. Help, what do I say, what do I do, where shall I look, what will people think? Keep going with this line of self-questioning and you'll get the sweats, a palpitating heart, a beet red face and, hey, goofy body language. The easiest of these situations is when the two of you are thrust together, sitting next to each other on the train, a plane, or bus, or riding in an elevator, waiting in the laundromat or the lobby of a hotel, working in adjacent booths at a trade show, or checking out the fruit to see if it's ripe at the same counter at your local supermarket. In these situations, you already have quite a bit in common to work with. Hi, hello, and good morning, accompanied by a smile, are all good ways to begin and a great way to get feedback. A return smile is a good indication that you're on the right track. Keep it simple and unimposing. Keep it courteous. Keep it happy and light. Don't get too close and personal right up front. Or you might get excluded. You want people to say to their friends, I met this really nice guy this morning, not this disgusting pervert tried to hit on me. Once you're sure the other person is responding favorably to the interaction, you can try some more specific opening lines. Not surprisingly, an opening line works better if it's an open question, but you may not always be able to find one that sounds natural. Sometimes you might have to start with a closed question or an occasional location statement. Do you know what time this bank closes today? Or, whew, that was quite a storm. So make sure you have an open question ready for the follow-up in case all you get in response is a yes or a no. 
Here are some examples of openers that you can try once you've said hello or exchanged smiles. Proceed them all with a location occasion statement. Anywhere. Where are you from? I've never been there. What's it like? How did you end up there? On a train, plane or bus. How long are you going to be in Duluth or Stratford or Mallorca? Where are you from? Have you always lived there? If yes, try, I've never been there. What's it like? If no, then, so where else have you lived? How long will you be traveling for? What do you think of Amtrak, Air Italia, these new Greyhound buses? As an interesting aside, when meeting someone for the first time, North Americans tend to ask, what do you do? Whereas Europeans prefer, where are you from? At the supermarket. If you're both standing in the fresh fruit line, staring at a pasta display or checking out avocados, you already have something in common. How can you figure out if there are enough muscles in that bag for two people? Can you tell me the difference between fresh pasta and the stuff in the packet? How can I tell if these are ripe? Do you know where they keep the bags for the produce? Have you ever tried this kind of sauce, frozen dessert, or mushrooms before? If yes, then how does it taste? What is it like? If no, is there another kind that you'd recommend? How long do you cook a chicken this big? I forgot to pick up some octopus. Do you mind saving my place in line? This can be a good icebreaker because you'll have an excuse to chat when you get back, if only about the octopus. Don't be gone too long, though, or you'll risk annoying at a party. In a hotel or motel lobby. Do you know where I can get a map? Have you stayed here before? If yes, what's it like? If no, neither have I, so how did you come to choose this hotel? Do you know this city at all? If it's yes, I've got only one day here. What do you think is a must-see? If no, so what brings you here? At a convention. So, where are you from? What seminars have really grabbed you so far? Do you know any good restaurants outside the hotel? What did you think of the keynote speaker? I'm going to get a coffee. Can I bring you one too? Offering to buy coffee works in countless situations as a way to sound out the other person's level of interest. Usually if they're not interested, they'll refuse your offer. If they accept, it means they're willing to interact further. At the laundromat, where can you get change around here? Do you know where I can buy some postage stamps, some orange juice, some cat food? I'm going to get a coffee. Can I bring you one too? Does it really matter if you mix whites with colors? In a line at a movie or a play or a concert. So why did you pick this movie or play or concert? So are you here to see Nev Campbell or what's her name, the other star? What did you think of the actor or the author or the performer's last film or play or CD? In a long waiting line, can you save my place so I can get a coffee? Can I get you one? At an exhibition or a museum or a trade show or a country fair. Wow, what do you think of that? Do you know where the vintage locomotives are? What's your favorite event or display or ride so far? Have you seen the giant pumpkin yet? Walking your dog or watching others walk theirs. He's adorable. What breed is he? Great leash. Where did you get it? So what a chihuahua's really like anyway? Here's a tip. Dog owners often end up socializing in public places, but don't get a dog unless you truly love animals. Running into someone you're familiar with, but have never plucked up the courage to talk to. Hi, I've got a couple of tickets to a play or a circus or a recital, and I was wondering if you'd like to join me. Hi, I'm really nervous, but I'd like to buy you coffee. In all of these situations, give the other person about three chances to interact. If after three questions or comments, he or she is clearly not responding enthusiastically, don't make a pest of yourself. Disentangle graciously by saying something like, have a nice day or enjoy the show or enjoy the rest of your flight or trip or holiday or whatever else is appropriate. Free information. It's actually easy to get free information from a stranger. This doesn't mean trying to learn someone's credit card number. What it means is learning the other person's name, interests, personal situation, and more. As you'll see, almost everybody is more than eager to give away this information if it's requested in the proper way. In fact, people will tend to follow your lead in offering information. That's why you say your name first, and the more you give, the more they will too. If you say, hi, I'm Carlos, you're likely to get, hi, I'm Paul. But if you start with, hi, I'm Carlos Garcia, you'll probably get back, hi, I'm Paul Tanaka. And if you start with, hi, I'm Carlos Garcia, I'm a friend of Gail's, Paul will probably respond in a similar way, hi, I'm Paul Tanaka, and I work with Gail's husband. 
When you add information tags to your name, people tend to respond to them because you've offered them the opportunity. If they don't respond, you've at least set up the situation. They know what you want, so give them a little encouragement, a raised eyebrow or a straight out, and you will spur them on. The idea is to respectfully gather as much information as possible by first offering information about yourself. You can use this information to broaden and deepen your rapport. But this is something to get your teeth into. You're building momentum. Missed cues. Mike arrives at the train station five minutes earlier than usual. It's a warm, misty morning, and there are about 20 other people on the platform. Most of the usual commuter crowd hasn't shown up yet. Mike tucks his newspaper under his arm, stirs his coffee with a plastic stirrer, then turns and flicks it into the garbage can just behind him. As he moves back to his spot, he notices an auburn-haired young woman in a dark grey suit walking towards him. The woman stops about ten feet away and sits on a bench. She carefully places her briefcase next to her and looks at her watch. Mike casts a sideways glance at her, half closing his eyes and pursing his lips slightly in appreciation. He's found himself in this type of situation almost more often than he cares to remember, eyeing someone, longing to approach her, and yet scared stiff at the prospect of making the connection. This time, he knows what he wants. He reminds himself that all he wants to do is start a conversation and get the young woman talking. His objective is not to have dinner with her tonight, not to go on holiday with her next Saturday, not to marry her by the end of the month, just to say a few words to see if she wants to be friendly. He says the most obvious thing he can think of. Hi, do you mind if I sit here? The woman moves slightly to her left. Oh, I don't mind, she murmurs, and Mike sits down. I haven't seen you at the station before, he says. This is my first day, she responds. I'm starting work at an ad agency in town. The train gets pretty crowded at this time, Mike says, but sometimes you can get a seat all the way. Mike has missed out on the free information. First day, ad agency, he should have picked up on this and used the conversation starters. Where, what, why, where, who, and how? What will you do there? Who are your main clients? Where is the agency? How did you get the job? All right, let's try it from the woman's point of view. Dorita, a website designer, is walking along the platform and sees an attractive, if rather tired-looking man seated on a bench. She sits down beside him and notices he's reading the latest P.D. James mystery. P.D. James is her favorite author. He smiles at her as she sits, and knowing that they have the book in common, she smiles back. But the man has gone back to reading. Dorita decides to plunge ahead. So, are you a P.D. James fan? No, says the man. Would you believe this is only the second mystery I've ever read? Why is that? I don't get much time for reading. I'm a resident at a hospital in the city. Oh, well, I've read all her books. She's my favorite mystery author, although I also like Dick Francis a lot. What response can Dorita expect? The last thing out of her mouth is a series of statements, not questions. Dorita was on track with her second query, a why question, but then she ignored the free information that Joel had given her. Instead, she went on talking about herself. If she'd been listening actively, she would have followed up with which hospital, a resident in what, why did you pick that speciality? The where, what, and why would have led her to further conversation. Active listening. Listening is the other side of the conversation coin. As a good active listener, you must demonstrate that you're truly interested in the other person. The key to being an active listener lies in making a sincere effort to absorb what the person is saying and feeling. Listening is different from hearing. You may hear a cello as part of an orchestra, but when you actively listen to that same cello, you're consciously focused on every note and absorbing the emotion. Active listening is an active attempt to grasp and understand the facts and underlying feelings of what is being said. It doesn't mean giving up your own opinions and feelings, but it does mean that you're there to empathize as much as possible. You can show how much you understand by giving the appropriate feedback. Listen with your eyes, listen with your body, nod your head, look at the person. Keep your stance open and leaning. Encourage the other person verbally. A distinction here should be made between the parrot phrasing school of listening and the active school of listening. Parrot phrasing or paraphrasing involves giving back more or less what the other person has just said. Paul, how have you been affected by the terrible weather we've been having? Kathy, I love heat waves like this, but the man I'm seeing is threatening to move to Alaska without me, and I think he's actually serious. Paul, sounds like even though you love heat waves, you might have to move to Alaska if you want to stay with the man you're seeing. The active school means responding to feelings. Paul, Sounds like you have some big decisions to make. Isn't it upsetting? How will you handle it? 
Simply put, with parrot phrasing, it only sounds like you're listening, whereas with active listening, people feel that you're listening and they feel that you care. Give spoken feedback. Get inside what the other person's saying. This kind of feedback ranges from primal sighs and international grunts like, whoa, mm-hmm, ah, ooh, mm -hmm, all the way down to full-blown reactions like, oh, really, and then what? You're not serious. So what did she do? Any kind of encouragement is welcome in conversation. It keeps the ball rolling and shows that you're listening, even though you're not saying much. Give physical feedback. Use open, encouraging body language. Nod in agreement and use plenty of eye contact, but don't stare. Look away in thought. Sometimes looking at your hands from time to time gives the impression of participation. If you're sitting in a chair, move to the edge of the chair and look interested or enthusiastic. If you're standing with your heart pointed at the other person, nod from time to time and look thoughtful or surprised or amused or whatever your really useful attitude inspires as an appropriate response to what the person's saying. Give and take. With practice, easy, natural conversation will become second nature to you. Here are some handy tips to work on as you develop and improve. First, as ever, assume a really useful attitude. Be curious and show concern for others. Encourage them to talk with you by giving sincere feedback. Work toward finding common interests, goals and experiences and communicating with enthusiasm, knowledge and interest. Face-to-face -face communication, establishing rapport is all about the hunt for common ground. Futility is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Hold up your own end of the conversation. Speak clearly and deliberately. Slowing down your rate of speech will make you feel more confident. So will a low-key display of your sense of humor. It also helps if you keep abreast of current events and the issues that affect our lives. So read a newspaper every day and be up to date on what's going on in the world, the big issues at least. In my seminars, I have the participants prepare their own 10-second commercial. It's really just a way of telling others who you are and what you do in a few short sentences. But be yourself. People will like you for who you are. The more you learn to relax, the easier this will become. Talking in color. All conversation, big or small, is about painting word pictures of your experiences for other people. The more vividly you can convey these experiences, the more interesting people will think you are. Here's a serviceable description of an everyday event. We stood in line for the streetcar for more than 20 minutes. I was so fed up. There's nothing here to engage the other person's imagination. So instead of talking in black and white, learn to talk in color. Involve as many of the senses as you can in your conversation. Describe what things look like, what they sound like, and how they make you feel, and if appropriate, what they smell and taste like. Let's try that sentence again. It was amazing standing there in the silence amongst all those people. The rain had just stopped and my collar was still wet. The lights of the buildings were shining on the puddles and the hot dog vendor behind us was ringing out his... You get the idea. This is sensory rich language and the imagination, both yours and theirs, revels in it because it was sensory rich. Handling compliments. Accept all compliments graciously. Do it simply, do it directly. Avoid the temptation to be too modest or self-effacing. The standard two-word response to a compliment is thank you. Then, if you choose to convert it into conversation, go ahead and do so. A compliment with an interesting but less gracious acknowledgement might go as follows. Marion, that's a beautifully tailored skirt. Oh, thanks, I got it for six bucks down at the Salvation Army store. A much simpler and rapport-enhancing response would be, thank you, it's nice of you to notice. Such a compliment should also be acknowledged with eye contact, a smile, and a pleasant tone of voice. Compliments are fine as long as they're sincere. Exaggerated or false compliments destroy credibility and endanger whatever rapport has been established. Cheap flattery, tired cliches, and patronizing remarks reek of insincerity and can be insulting. On the other hand, an honest expression of praise can reinforce self-confidence and even lift the rapport onto a more heartfelt and personal level. If you notice something good or interesting about someone or a praiseworthy performance, then a compliment is in order, but try and avoid general words like nice or good and great. Nice suit, big deal. Blue really suits you, sounds much better. You're such a good person, sounds like a build-up to being dumped. You bring out the best in everyone. Now, that's a compliment. Specific compliments usually come across as being more sincere than general compliments. Great suit won't stimulate your host or hostess as much as, was that the tiniest hint of fresh dill I just tasted? You've done it again. 
If you're complimenting a performance, take the trouble to go into detail. You were wonderful today is not half as powerful as you handle that question about the nursing home without flinching. That was an impressive strategy. Deliver your compliment the same way you do your greeting. Open your heart and your body. Look directly at the person. Speak with a clear, enthusiastic voice. Give specific praise. And remember to give the person time to respond. An exercise in tonality. Sound effects. Your tone of voice tells other people how you're feeling. And a pleasing tonality can positively affect the way they respond to you. Pleasing tonality occurs when your voice comes from deep down in your body, from your abdomen. It's rich, deep, and infectious, compared to a monotonous or high-pitched braying voice. To improve your own tonality, practice breathing and speaking from your abdomen. Belly breathing, which uses your lungs to the fullest, is the most calming and healthy way to breathe. You breathe more slowly and with less stress. Contrast this to chest breathing, which is the way about 60% of the population get their air. Chest breathing is panicky, fight-or-flight breathing, just a series of long pants. Naturally, if you breathe from your chest, you'll speak from your chest. So try this. Put the palm of one hand gently on your chest and the palm of the other gently on your abdomen. Practice breathing until the hand on your chest doesn't move in and out and the hand on your abdomen does. When you've got it, take away your hands and just keep breathing that way for the rest of your life. You'll notice that when you get nervous or excited, your breathing will return to your chest. Be aware of this and take it back down. You'll immediately feel calmer. Repeat this exercise with your hands on the place where your voice originates. Move your voice from your chest to your abdomen. It should sound lower, richer and a little slower, which is exactly the way you want it to be for establishing instant rapport and making people like you in 90 seconds or less. Avoiding the pitfalls. If you catch yourself doing any of the following don'ts, you may have abandoned your really useful attitude or chosen a useless attitude by mistake. Don't interrupt and end other people's sentences for them, no matter how enthusiastic or impatient you might be. Take Dale Carnegie's advice. Don't complain, don't condemn, and don't criticize. Whenever possible, avoid giving one-word answers. They don't usually qualify as conversation, and they put a heavy strain on rapport. People who monopolize conversations also trample all over rapport because there is little or no room to find common ground. They just come off as being rude or boring. There's nothing quite so disconcerting as talking to someone who's looking elsewhere. If this happens to you, excuse yourself as fast as possible. People who do this are incongruent and frankly just plain rude. Finally, look out for bad breath and all the other nasty personal hygiene stuff. No excuses here. Dragon breath, B.O. and spinach in your teeth might not make you any less lovable in the eyes of your golden retriever, but they certainly won't do anything for you at the office party. Making yourself memorable. What good is meeting someone for the first time, creating a terrific first impression and establishing rapport, if two weeks later the person's forgotten you? That's like writing a terrific story on your computer and forgetting where you filed it. Give other people a reason to remember you, and they will. The mind delights in making connections. You'll remember from Professor Moravian's work on believability that face-to-face -face communication was broken up into 55% the way we look, 38% the way we sound, and 7% the actual words we use. Something similar holds true for memory. Other studies show that what people see has about three times as much impact as what they hear. So ask yourself these questions. How can I stand out from the rest? Is there a persona or some little touch of style I can create for myself? All kinds of things can give you an image. A fresh cornflower worn in your lapel or discreet, very expensive frames for your eyeglasses, a beautiful vest, impeccable shoes, a bow tie, the galloping gourmet suspenders, Gillian Anderson's hair, or Goldie Horn's laugh. Lasting Impressions Jill and Robin, two middle-aged ladies, are sitting across from each other at a table in a French restaurant. They're halfway through lunch when several people are shown to a table nearby. A young woman in the group recognizes Jill and lets out a gasp of delight. She'd been a student of Jill's in one of Jill's classes several years ago. After many hugs and exclamations, Jill turns to her lunch companion. Robin, this is Edwina. She was one of my most wonderful students back in the days in Stratford. I'll never forget she had these rituals for organizing herself and her work. Everything had to have its own special place and order at her desk. Sometimes she drove me crazy, but it always used to fascinate me how meticulous she was. 
Nice to meet you, Robin says, taking Edwina's hands. So tell me, Edwina, what are you doing these days, Jill asks. Edwina proceeds to tell Jill about her work as an associate producer on a local TV show and then adds, there are quite a few of us there from school. Do you remember Suzanne Sparks? No, I'm sorry, I can't quite picture her, Jill says, searching about with her eyes. You know, the one who always came to class in those crazy leather vests. Oh, yes, of course. Jill turns to Robin, including her in the picture. Suzanne was a terrific painter. I believe she spoke Spanish and German, too. Does she still have that mop of spiky red hair, she asks, turning back to Edwina. No, she's long and blonde now, and she's our director of programming. And what about Tony, Edwina continues. She's at the station, too. Now, which one was Tony, Jill asks. Tony Marsh. She was always really friendly, lived out in Malton. When Jill gives no sign of recognition, Edwina says, She was such a hard worker. Sorry, dear, I can't place Tony. Who else? Greg Cuddy. He's our sales manager. Not Greg, the guy with the nose ring. Jill shakes her head in disbelief. Greg Cuddy was such a nervous young man. He drove his mother's pickup truck everywhere. If memory serves me correctly, he ran a train spotting site on the internet. Jill invites Edwina to join them at their table, and her friends at the other table order lunch without her as the reminiscing continues. The point of this story is that it's easy for Jill to recall her former students when her memory is triggered by an image. People are more likely to be remembered if they have some kind of handle, some kind of device that makes them stand out from the crowd. A friend of mine works for a national chain of megastores that sell computers and stereos. I could spend half an hour explaining the features of a product, she told me, and then the customer would go away to think about it and come back another day, go up to the first salesperson they saw and make the purchase. It didn't matter that he had my card or that I gave him so much time. The chances of him coming back to me personally were slim. Then I hit on a way to be memorable. Since I'm from Newfoundland, I tell customers to ask for the new fee when they come back or phone the store. In Canada, a new fee is often the target of dumb, stereotypical jokes, but my friend used this verbal image to her advantage. It's a handle, or if you prefer, a, a container to hold and access a whole package of previously stored information. Find something to set you apart from the rest. Give them something to remember you by. Chapter 8, Making Sense of Our Senses On one level, we humans are not much more than mobile sensing devices. We see, hear, feel, smell and taste. And then we process the information gained through our senses. Every day we experience the world through sensory input. And then we explain our experiences to ourselves and to others. That's about it. Then we go to bed and get up the next day and experience all over again. This is how we evolve. Obviously, this is a major oversimplification, but for the purpose of this chapter, it gives us a basic foundation on which to build. This is where our really useful or useless attitude originates. There are two ways of explaining our experiences to ourselves and others. We call them explanatory styles. Upon waking up in the morning and seeing that it's raining outside, an individual with a negative explanatory style might say, oh, heck, it's raining, it's going to be a lousy day. Whereas someone with a positive explanatory style might say, hey, free car wash and great for the garden. The point is that the nature of our explanation determines our attitudes, and people have differing responses to the same external reality. We can loosely categorize these responses into familiar mindsets and patterns. In the 1970s, Richard Bandler and John Grinder, the founders of neuro-linguistic programming, noticed in their early work with clients that people could be roughly divided into three types, depending on how they filtered the world through their senses. They call these types visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. For example, let's say three students go to a rock concert. Judy is primarily visual, takes in the world through the way things look. Phyllis is auditory takes in the world to the way things sound, and Alex is kinesthetic, responds to physical sensation. When they later describe their experiences to their friends, Judy will paint word pictures and tell what the concert looked like. Oh, wow, you should have seen it. All those people jumping about and the singer ripped his pants off and his toupee flew off. Phyllis will say what the concert sounded like. The music was incredible. The beat was deafening. Everyone was yelling and singing along. You should have heard it. It was a real screamer. And Alex, who relates to feelings and touch, will describe what it felt like. Oh, man, you could just feel the energy. The place was packed. We could hardly move. And when they played Blue Rodeo, the whole place erupted. In other words, visuals tend to use picture words, auditories choose sound words, and kinesthetics favor physical words. 
What we're talking about here is a new dimension of synchrony and rapport. This chapter will go beyond attitude, body language, and voice tone to the very way our senses take in and literally make sense of the world around us. Visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. Because we receive our information from the outside world, primarily in pictures, sounds, and feelings, these are the three ways in which we can be inspired by something we see externally or internally in our mind's eye as an image or a vision, by something we hear either externally or emanating from that little voice inside, or by something we feel or touch. Usually it's a combination of these experiences that helps us interpret the outside world. But one of these three senses, sight, sound or touch, tends to dominate the other two. To the untrained eye or ear, all of us look, sound and feel just like ordinary folks. However, to the trained person, there are subtle but important differences. As you might imagine, an individual who gives primary importance to the way things look will be concerned with and influenced by appearances. Similarly, someone to whom sound is important will respond to the way things sound, and a person who experiences the world through physical sensations will be concerned with the way things feel, both internally and externally, through touch. Last year, I was listening to two politicians being interviewed on the radio. They were both thinking of running for the leadership of their party. When the interviewer asked them to voice their plans, one said, quite thoughtfully, I'm leaning heavily toward giving it a shot. The much quicker response from the other man was, now that we have a clearer view of the future, I can see the possibilities. The interviewer responded, sounds like you're both ready to announce your intentions. Well, what do you reckon? Can you grasp the distinction? The interviewer, using phrases like, voice your plans, announce your intentions, was possibly auditory. In all fairness, that would be natural language to use on the radio, but still, a surprising number of radio hosts turn out to be auditory. The first aspiring leader used physical language, lean heavily, give it a shot, and spoke deliberately, indicating a kinesthetic inclination. The second hopeful candidate had a clearer view and could see the possibilities, and therefore came across as pretty visual to me. Of course, no one is totally visual, utterly auditory, or 100% kinesthetic. Naturally, we're a mixture of all three, yet in every person, one of these systems, rather like left or right-handedness, dominates the other two. Studies have shown that as many as 55% of all people in our culture are motivated primarily by what they see, and we call them visual. 15% by what they hear, we call them auditory, and 30% by physical sensation. We call them kinesthetic. Grab a pencil and let's try a self-test. Let's determine what's your favorite sense. Where would you place yourself among visuals, auditories, and kinesthetics? Like many people, you'll probably say, oh, I'm visual for sure. But you might be in for a big surprise. Let's try this test to see how you tune into the world. Choose only one answer, A, B, or C, from each question, and note your answer on a piece of paper. Question one, if only three rooms are left at a beach resort, I'll choose the room that offers A, an ocean view but lots of noise, B, sounds of the ocean but no view, and C, comfort but lots of noise and no view. Question two, when I have a problem, I A, look for alternatives, B, I talk about the problem, and C, I rearrange the details. Question three, when riding in a car, I want the inside to A. Look good B. Sound quiet or powerful C. Feel comfortable or secure Question 4. When I explain a concert or event I've just attended, I first A. Describe how it looked B. Tell people how it sounded or C. Convey the feeling 5. In my spare time, I most enjoy A, watching TV or going to the movies, B, reading or listening to music, C, doing something physical like a craft or gardening or playing a sport. Six, the one thing I personally believe everyone should experience in his or her lifetime is A, a sight, B, a sound, or C, a feeling. 7. Of the following activities I spend most time indulging in A. Daydreaming 
B. Listening to my thoughts. And C. Picking up on my feelings. 8. When someone's trying to convince me of something, A. I want to see evidence or proof. B. I talk myself through it. C. I trust my intuition. 9. I usually speak and think A. Quickly B. Moderately C. Slowly 10. I normally breathe from A. High in my chest B. Low in my chest C. My belly 11. When finding my way around an unfamiliar city A. I use a map B. I ask for directions C. I trust my intuition. 12. When I choose clothes, it's most important to me that A. I look immaculate B. I make a personal statement about my personality and C. I feel comfortable. 13. When I choose a restaurant, my main concern is that A. It looks impressive B. I can hear myself talk or C. I'll be comfortable. 14. I make decisions A. Quickly B. Moderately C. Slowly Tally your A's, B's and C's. See how many A's you got, how many B's and how many C's. A is visual, B is auditory and C is kinesthetic. The higher the number in each category, the stronger the tendency. Now, by taking this test, not only will you have a strong indication of how your three main senses stack up, but you'll also begin to understand how people can have differing priorities. However, there are many variables here at work, not the least of which is that you already knew the purpose of the test before you took it. In my seminars, I generally have people complete this test before they realize its significance. Try it out on a few friends and see how they fare. Use their results to further your insight in being able to recognize sensory preferences. From the test, you'll begin to see why you connect easily with some people when you first meet them, but not at all with others, and why you feel as if you know certain people, even though you've never met them before. It comes down to sensory harmony. When two visuals meet, they're familiar to each other because they see things the same way. This doesn't mean they agree, and express their experiences in the same way. The same goes for two auditories or two kinesthetics. On the other hand, if the person you meet sees, hears or feels the world in a different way from yours, you need to learn how to recognize that fact and how to adapt to tune in to his or her wavelength to establish rapport that can lead to a meaningful friendship or relationship. To give you an idea of how sensory preferences impact on your day-to-day -day life, let me tell you about my own situation. I am auditory and my wife is kinesthetic. If we have a falling out, Wendy knows how to connect to me in my language with auditory words. She gets my immediate attention by saying, Nick, you're not listening to me. You're not hearing a word I'm saying. If she were to say, can't you see what I'm saying? Or even worse, can't you see how that makes me feel? The truth is no. No, I can't. Sure, I can make the obvious intellectual connection, but I have to stop and think about it. My brain has to take the extra step of translating her language into something I can relate to. When she sends a message on my auditory wavelength, she makes a direct connection and fast. Conversely, if I want to connect directly to her sensibilities, I say, I know how you feel when that happens. In other words, I use a touchy-feely kinesthetic approach, simple yet extraordinarily effective. Tuning in to sensory preferences. What do sensory types have to do with making people like you in 90 seconds or less? Well, much more than you might expect. When you can figure out other people's sensory preferences, you can communicate on their wavelength. If you want to better relate to your spouse, win a judge over to your side of the argument, make that sale, land that job, or impress somebody at a party, recognizing visual, auditory, and kinesthetic people can be invaluable. The day after one of my seminars, I received an excited phone call from a woman who'd been sitting in the audience. Her name was Barbara, and she owned a flooring store. It's incredible, she said. It's 9.30, we've been open for one hour, and I've just sold to my fifth out of five customers. I've never done that before. This is perfect for my business, she continued, referring to my lecture on figuring out the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic people we come across in the course of our daily adventures. The first four sales were probably normal, even though I was aware of what I'd learned, but the fifth, 
This lady came into the shop dragging her husband along with her. It was obvious he didn't want to be there, but I figured out immediately that he was a, a feeler, he was kinesthetic, and within 30 seconds, he was on his hands and knees feeling the carpet, and they bought it. I just knew that if I'd have said to him, imagine how this will look in your house, he couldn't do that because he's not visual. Or if I'd said, you'll discover how quiet it'll be when your kids run around it, he couldn't connect to that either because he doesn't think that way. He's not auditory. I knew by the way he dressed and moved and spoke that he was kinesthetic. So I said, just feel it. And he did, just like that. He got down on the floor and felt it. Find out what you're getting. Change what you do until you get what you want. These are the F and C in our KFC. Figure out which sense a person relies on most and change your approach to take this into consideration. If you're not sure how to handle a situation, don't worry. Be prepared to include all three preferences in your approach. Look good for the visuals. After all, they make up over half the people you're likely to see during the day. Sound good. Develop your pleasing tonality for the auditories to whom you'll be speaking. And be sensitive and flexible for the kinesthetic folk you'll be bumping into. And of course, if you're dealing with a group, the same thing applies. Your group will be made up of all three categories, and you'll want to appeal to all of them. Metaphorically speaking, the words, I've scoured the four corners of the earth, tell a lot more than I've looked everywhere. They force the connection to scrutiny, diligence, detail, determination, and more. They also easily involve sight, sound, and feeling. And this is why metaphors appeal simultaneously to visuals, auditories, and kinesthetics. Because visuals can see what you're saying, auditories can hear them, and kinesthetics can get a feel for what's happening. Metaphors are containers for ideas. They link our internal imagination to external reality. We use metaphors regularly, often unconsciously, to explain our thinking. We also use them to make things more interesting. Parables, fables, storytelling and anecdotes are some of the oldest and most powerful communication tools we have. And their metaphorical aspects are effective in virtually every setting. They fire up the imagination and appeal to all the senses. In short, Metaphors help make understanding easier, quicker, and richer. Above all, remember that the ability to tune into the way other people experience the world can be one of the most important discoveries of your life. Sights and Sounds Despite the good Colombian coffee and the fresh croissants, the O'Connors are not enjoying a very pleasant breakfast. It's a bright yellow Maserati, John exclaims. It's gorgeous. Can't you just picture the two of us blazing down the highway to the coast? Actually, I can't, says Lizzie icily. All I can hear are the monthly bills dropping through our mail slot. I don't think you ever listen when I tell you we have more important things to spend money on. John stomps out of the house in a rage. But that evening after leaving work, he buys a luxurious, multicolored silk scarf for Lizzie in an attempt to win her over. Arriving home, he finds her in the living room and hands her the exquisitely wrapped box. And what's this for, Lizzie asks distantly as she removes the scarf from its box. What's the occasion? It's just to show you how much I love you. A scarf doesn't tell me anything, Lizzie snaps and walks out of the room. John slumps down on the couch, slowly winding the expensive scarf around his hand and tightening it until his fingers throb with pain. What happened here? Well, John is visual. He makes sense of the world primarily through what he sees. The yellow Maserati, his picture of them in the car, the multi-hued scarf. But Lizzie's auditory. She hears the car bills dropping through the mail slot. She doesn't think John listens when she tells him something. Can this marriage be saved? You bet. A pair of concert tickets to Lizzie's favorite band. Something that appeals to her ears would sound much better to her. Here's how John could have handled it had he been more sensitive to the way Lizzie hears the world. I'm really sorry, Lizzie, John would say in a soft, pleasing voice, after giving her the tickets. He uses auditory words with his wife. I'll tell you what, let's put some harmony back in this house and talk it through a bit. Does that sound okay to you? Lizzie nods, taking in the suddenly more acceptable words and the meaning they convey. Have I told you how the Maserati purrs like a kitten's and shifts so quietly you can barely hear it, John asks sweetly, and wait till we discuss the surprisingly reasonable payments. Oh, I finally see the picture you're painting, John, says his wife. It's all so clear to me now. A few months ago, I gave the opening address at a home builders convention. During my talk, I used role-playing, with me playing all the roles, to illustrate some of the behavioral differences that visual, auditory, and kinesthetic people display in face-to-face -face communication. 
At the end of the talk, a big, tough-looking but well-groomed man pulled me to one side. He was very emotional, and he looked like he was on the verge of tears, shaking his head from side to side. He said, I don't know what to say. I'm leaving right now to go to my son's school and give him a hug. He was choking up. For years, I've been furious with him. When I talk to him, he turns his head away, and he doesn't look at me. He drives me crazy, and I yell at him, look at me when I'm talking. He hardly ever looks me straight in the eye when I'm giving him instructions. But from everything you've said, you've made me realize he's auditory. He's not ignoring me when he looks away. He's turning his ear towards me so he can concentrate. And me, I'm visual. I need eye contact. He pumped my hand and left. It's amazing. These things go on right under our noses every day of our lives, and we never realized. Not until now, that is. Chapter 9, Spotting Sensory Preferences. Recognizing which sense other people rely on to experience the world and then using this information in your dealings with others, whether personal, professional, or social, can have a profound effect on how they respond to you. This chapter deals with picking up the initial cues that other people give us without knowing it. Whether visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, their signals are there for us to interpret and utilize in establishing rapport. In the question period at the end of one of my seminars, a middle-aged woman in the second row asked slowly, do you feel it's hard to put your finger on what a person's sensory preference is? This delightful woman wore a big, comfortable knit coat and was twiddling her finger slowly through her hair as she spoke. I thanked her for the question and immediately asked her not to move. Obviously a very good-natured person, she froze in position. I'm going to ask you to repeat your question in exactly the same way, I said to her, but I want the rest of the audience to observe. Is that okay? She nodded, paused and repeated her question, complete with hair twiddling. There was a collective smile from the other people in the audience as they understood what they'd just witnessed. Then the lady herself looked up to the top of her head and chuckled. Her choice of the words feel, hard, and put your finger on, her easy way of speaking, her comfortable coat, her slightly full figure, and her habit of playing with her hair were quite the giveaways. She had dropped enough clues to give the whole audience a strong indication as to what this woman's sensory preferences might be. You weren't there, but what sense do you think she most relies on? You're right on if you said kinesthetic. TV giveaways. TV talk shows are a great place to brush up on your sensory preference spotting talents. The late shows where everyone tends to overdress are usually not the best venues for this exercise. Far better are the interview shows with hosts like Charlie Rose or Larry King or local talk shows where people are more themselves. Turn down the volume and try to figure out through physical appearances, hand gestures, eye movements and clothing whether the person is visual, auditory or kinesthetic. Then turn up the volume and listen to the words, the pace of speech and the tonality of the voice. You can do the same with radio interviews. Concentrate on the words. Radio talk shows are a mine of information about sensory preferences, and you can practice while you're stuck in traffic. Take it slowly. Have fun. Sensory preference profiles. Each group displays subtle differences in physical and mental makeup. These are definitely not hard and fast distinctions. They're simply indicators. Visuals, auditories, and kinesthetics can come in all shapes and sizes. We're dealing with people here, unique individuals with unlimited beliefs and values, opinions and talents, shades and sparkles, innuendos and dreams. But each one is different. Yet, deep down, there are fundamental similarities. Find a person who strongly favors one sense in a number of areas discussed in this chapter, and chances are he or she will be signaling a personal sensory preference. Here's a quick tip. Visuals usually talk very fast. Kinesthetics tend to talk slowly. And auditories fall somewhere in between. As you become aware of the differences among these three groups of people, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, what seems subtle at first will become more and more obvious to you. Perhaps you've had the experience of buying a new car. Let's say you bought a nifty little blue Miata. Very unique. Well, not quite. Suddenly, blue Miatas are everywhere. Whereas before, you only notice them once in a, in a while, you start to see them all over the place. Of course, these cars were there all the time. They just held no interest for you. When you become more accomplished at distinguishing one person from another, the same thing will happen. The distinctions will reveal themselves before your eyes, and yet they've been there all the time. Visuals. Visual people care a lot about how things look. They need to see proof or evidence before they take anything seriously. Being visualizers, they tend to think in pictures and wave their hands around, sometimes touching their pictures when talking. When I say think in pictures, if I were to ask you where the milk is in your refrigerator right now, you had to make a picture to do that. 
Pictures come quickly to their mind's eye, so they think clearly. This makes them the fast talkers among us. Sometimes they're the ones with monotonous voices. Visuals frequently look up to the left and the right when they speak. When it comes to their wardrobe, they tend to be snappy, impeccable dressers who put a lot of work into looking good and surrounding themselves with good-looking stuff. Physically, because they're concerned with appearance, they aim to be trim and tidy. When they stand and sit, their body and head will usually be upright with good body posture. You'll find visuals working where confident, fast decisions are needed or where specific procedures are to be followed. They want to have control because they probably have some kind of vision of how things should be. Many, but definitely not all, visual artists fall into this category. Auditories. Auditory people respond emotionally to the quality of sound. They enjoy the spoken word and love conversation, but things must sound right for them to tune in and give their attention. They have fluid, melodic, sensitive, persuasive, expressive voices. Auditories move their eyes from side to side as they talk and gesture somewhat less than visuals, but when they do, it tends to be from side to side, like their eye movements. When it comes to clothes, they think they're snappy dresses. They like to make a statement with their clothing, and sometimes they don't quite make it. Physically, they are somewhere in between the trim visuals and the comfortable kinesthetics. Auditories work where words and sound are the currency. Many broadcasters, teachers, lawyers, counsellors, and writers are auditory. Kinesthetics. For our sensitive kinesthetics, things have to be solid, well-constructed, and right-feeling in order for them to go along. They have lower, easy-going voices and gestures. Some kinesthetics have been known to speak unbelievably slowly or add all sorts of unnecessary details that can drive the visuals and auditory to the point of wanting to yell, please, for heaven's sake, I got it ten minutes ago. That's just the way many of them are. The fact of the matter is that it takes longer to put feelings into words than it does to translate pictures or sounds into words. When they speak, kinesthetics will look down towards their feelings. They enjoy the way things feel. They like textured clothing and quiet tones. Any man with permanent facial hair may well be kinesthetic. You'll find kinesthetics in hands-on positions, plumbers, electricians, carpenters, product salespeople, and workers in the arts, medicine, and the food business. Physically, there are two kinds of kinesthetics. In one group are the athletes, dancers, emergency services, and tradesfolk, the super fit types for whom the physicality of touch and contact are paramount. In the other group are the sensitive, laid-back, down-to-earth, big-hearted types who may have a higher proportion of, of fuller bodies among their number. Matches and mismatches. You can probably see for yourself that the chances of establishing a loving relationship with someone like you are high. But is this always a good idea? Well, yes and no. If you want to spend your life with someone very much like you, then yes. But what if you want some sparks and excitement? I'm frequently asked whether there's any validity in the age-old aphorism that opposites attract. The answer is yes, they most definitely do. But how and what do they attract? First, let me say that this book is about establishing rapport and making people like you. If rapport and liking lead to friendship and romance, that's up to you. I like and trust and care about a lot of people, but they're not all my friends and they're definitely not my partners. Falling for someone emotionally is more complex. Many of the old classic languages refer to three types of love or affection. Roughly translated, they include general love, or in other words, love of humanity, brotherly love, and sexual love. When all three are present, a relationship is indeed rich. In my opinion, and it has no scientific basis other than my close enough acquaintanceship with more than 35 couples whose relationships have lasted more than 20 years and are still vibrant, the following observation holds true. Relationships that have endured more than 20 years have an interesting pattern of sensory preferences. They are actually complete opposites. You'll remember from the self-test that the tally at the end allowed you to rank your preferences. Let's use my own rating as an example. I ranked first A, then V, and then K, or as we call it, AVK. The complete opposite of my ranking would be KVA. If you stack them side by side, that you see their exact opposites. This would give us opposites at the top, auditory and kinesthetic, for spark and interest, but the same in the middle, in this case, the visual. The relationship is held together by the common visual link, a mutual subconscious sharing of the same wavelength, and the relationship is kept vital by opposing auditory and kinesthetic as primary personal and sensory preferences. My observation is that when two people meet in the middle, they share a central sensory preference, whether visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, and it's that bond which will get them through the rough times and add sparkle to the good times. But any shared preferences, be they primary, 
secondary or tertiary will work in the favour of the relationship when the going gets tough. Verbal cues. There are no fixed rules here, except that the people you meet will tend to reveal how they change their experiences into words by the type of words they use. Listen for these words and take them into account when you set out to establish rapport. Pushing for more. This simple technique has proved helpful in determining a person's sensory preference. Start by asking a couple of non-specific questions like, do you live in the city or in the suburbs? Followed up after the response by, do you like it? If the answer is yes, ask, what do you like most about it? If the answer is no, follow up with, what don't you like about it? As the reasons are given, push for more. Expanding on answers like, well, for one thing it's peaceful, can be encouraged by the question, what else? And don't stop there. Pursue your line of questioning until you have enough verbal cues to get a handle on the person's favourite sense. Visual words. A tendency to favour picture words and metaphors. If we look more clearly, the difference is like night and day, may be a strong indication that the person relies mainly on visual sense. Here's an exercise. For one entire day, from dawn to dusk, Focus on the visual words and phrases that you hear in other people's vocabulary. Notice them until they appear as clear as the three extremely visual words I just used in this one sentence. Here are some picturesque words that will give you perspective and focus as you observe people who scrutinize the world with their eyes. Make the effort in your conversation with other people to talk in color by painting word pictures. Describe your experiences vividly so other people can see them. Here are some visual words. Analyze, appear, brilliant, colorful, diagram, enlighten, envision, glimpse, hindsight, illuminate, light, mind's eye, portray, perspective, survey, show, witness. Here's some visual phrases. How do you see yourself? It's a bit hazy right now. I see what you're saying. He's such a colourful character. It's a sight for sore eyes. Let's get some perspective. We are a company with vision. We see eye to eye on the subject. It's a bit vague, beyond a shadow of doubt. See you later. Can you imagine? Let me make this clear. Can you shed some light on this? We have a bright future. Auditory words. Tune into auditory words and phrases as people express them to one another. Call to mind and amplify all those harmonious discussions within your hearing range until you are well informed about how they sound. Listen how these auditory words just click into place. Open your ears to those who see and feel the world through their hearing and you'll get the message loud and clear. Announce, earshot, chime, clang, clash, inquire, listen, loud, resonate, rasp, pronounce, proclaim, shrill, Silence, tinkling, tone, utter, well-informed, word for word. And here's some auditory phrases. Sounds familiar. Tell me more. Does that ring a bell? He gave a satisfactory account of himself. At last we have harmony at home. They granted me an audience. She had me completely tongue-tied. These colors are really loud. I didn't like the tone of his voice. Let me tell you. Tell me how. She's a scream in a manner of speaking. I want everybody in the room to voice an opinion. He received a thunderous applause. That's as clear as a bell. Hold your tongue. Are you tuning into what I'm saying? Kinesthetic words. The following physical words are the currency of a kinesthetic. Tap into the emotions around you until you get a handle on how they flow. Overcome any and all stumbling blocks. Build a firm foundation on which you can base your own contact with other people. Use these concrete, touching words that move kinesthetic people thanks to their sensitivity and feelings. Boils down to, catch on, come to grips with, I have a hunch, light-headed, make contact, sort out, squeeze, stretch, support, tap into, throw out, topsy-turvy, underhanded, warm. And here are some kinesthetic phrases. How do you feel about? There were a few stumbling blocks. I'll get in touch with her. It slipped through the cracks. I'm all shook up. I'm not following you. Let's sort things out. Get a load of this. Can you pull some strings? She came to grips with the problem. I can't handle the pressure. He's a pain in the neck. Stay in touch. Hang in there. I can't put my finger on anything concrete. Start from scratch. Walk me through the ceremony one more time. I feel cool, calm and collected. Let's explore the possibilities. IQs. 
Over the years, I've shot more fashion magazine covers with more models in more countries than I can remember. And frequently, the model's first language was not English. When all you have to work with is a face, neck, and shoulders, and of course the extraordinary talents of hair, makeup, and fashion stylists, you soon realize that besides subtle tilts and leans, most of the innuendo suggested by this kind of close-up comes from facial expressions from eyes and mouth. When you want a model to smile, you don't tell her to smile, you make her smile. To initiate eye movements, there were always a few code words that seemed to work in any language. When you want your subject to look up and to the side, it's enough just to say, dream, and up go the eyes to one side or the other. Words such as secret or telephone will send the eyes sideways toward the ears, and if you say sad or romantic or thoughtful, the eyes will normally go down to the left or to the right. Once again, the originators of neuro-linguistic programming had observed this phenomenon of eye movements and codified them into an interesting paradigm. On the basis of their findings, we can think of the human eyeball as a, a six-way switch that must be flicked into any one of six positions as it searches for information, each position activating a sense, sometimes to remember, sometimes to create an answer. If you ask a man to tell you the color of his favorite shirt, you may see him look up and to his left as he pictures the shirt before he gives you the answer. Ask a woman to tell you what silk feels like, and chances are she'll look down to her right as she remembers how silk feels in her mind. In other words, when asked a question, people have to look away in order to generate the answer. The reason is quite simple. They are accessing their senses. Try this. Turn down the sound on your TV during an interview and watch the guest's eyes hunt about for answers to the interviewer's questions. Here's something else you can try. Ask somebody a question. Without telegraphing your intent, look the person in the eye and ask a non-specific question, such as, what did you like most about your last holiday or birthday or job? Then watch the person's eyes dart off to get the information. This will give you a fairly good idea of how he or she stores and accesses information, in other words, as pictures, sounds, or feelings. Consistent reference to one sense are also an indication of a sensory preference. People who answer such questions while looking up to the left or the right are most likely visualizing the answer. If they look left or right towards their ears, they're probably recalling sound information. If they look down to the left, they may well be accessing their feelings, and down to the right indicates some type of internal dialogue. Research has varying views as to the validity of these neuro-linguistic programming IQs, but I find them fairly accurate, and most importantly, they lead to proactive eye contact for many people who are often too shy to look another person directly in the eye without discomfort. Another valuable detail to be aware of here is that when we look to the left, we're probably remembering information, while looking the other way to the right means we're probably constructing it. Keep in mind that when you converse with someone, there may be several mental activities going on at once. For example, a fellow asks a young woman, seen the latest Bruce Willis movie? Yes, I have, she says, going into her mind and picturing herself in the waiting line as she remembers, but at the same time, she's having an internal dialogue. What a boring twit. Am I judging too quickly? No, he's a bore. How can I dump him? Then he says, want to go out Saturday night? Grasping for any excuse, she finally mutters, gosh, I can't. I have to um, finish up a report for Monday morning deadlines. Her eyeballs dart off to the other side as she constructs a picture of herself at the kitchen table with a laptop. Feeling a bit confused, imagine you're facing a person. If they look up to the left... They're constructing an image in their mind. If they look up to the right, they're remembering an image. If they look sideways to the left, they are creating a sound in their mind. If they look towards the right, they're remembering a sound. If they look down towards the left, they're accessing feelings and body sensations. If they look down to the right, they're processing internal dialogue, also known as talking to yourself. The following is an exercise in IQs. Try this with a friend. Stand in front of them and ask them some questions, and watch where their eyeballs go. The directions I'm going to give you are your left and your right. Ask them, what color socks are you wearing? And watch their eyes go up and to the right, because they're visually remembering. Ask them, how would you look in a green jacket? And watch their eyes go up and to the left. They're constructing a visual. Can you remember what Purple Haze sounds like by Jimi Hendrix? Their eyes will go sideways to the right because they're remembering a sound. What would it sound like if it was played on the bagpipes? Their eyes will go sideways to the left because they're imagining or constructing a sound. What does sound feel like? Watch their eyes go down to the left as they access their feelings. And what are you telling yourself right now? 
watch their eyes go down and to the right as they process internal dialogue and talk to themselves. Incidentally, these actions are not the same as the movements your eyeballs make when you look around a room or across a landscape. They're totally independent of the requirements of the ability to see. Your eyeballs serve two purposes, one, roving about to see what's going on, and two, activating sensory memory channels. When you first begin looking for eye cues, people's eyes may appear to dart about randomly. All you need, though, is a little practice at reading these movements. Have fun, let it happen naturally, and above all, never tell anyone what you're doing. That would quite rightly make people self-conscious and embarrassed. Keep these skills to yourself. An exercise in spotting preferences. Brain lock. Challenge a friend to answer the following questions without moving her eyes. Tell her to look directly at you at all times and keep her eyeballs perfectly still. Then ask the first question. Do you like the house or apartment or whatever you live in? Depending on whether she answers yes or no, ask the follow-up question. Quickly list six things you like or don't like about where you live. Because they have to keep their eyeballs still, either your friend will be completely tongue-tied or she'll find herself struggling to think of an answer. Searching for how things look, sound or feel without any eye movement is almost impossible. She'll be like a rabbit paralyzed in the grip of a car's headlights. Hypnotists know that if they can stop your eyeballs from moving, you won't be able to think. A meditative state is easily accessed in the same way. Stare at a stationary spot with your eyes open or place your attention in one spot, your forehead, for example, with your eyes closed. Provided you can keep your attention fixed, you will stop your inner dialogue and lose all sense of time. The big picture. The implications of verbal and IQs discussed in this chapter are vitally important to anyone who wants to connect with other human beings and establish rapport by design. When you learn to recognize which type or group a new acquaintance belongs to, you'll be able to communicate with him or her on a more appropriate wavelength, be it visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. In this way, you'll be hours, sometimes years ahead of where you would have been if you'd not known how to figure out an individual's sensory preference. Developing a knack for detecting sensory preferences means paying close attention to others, and this alone makes you actively more people-oriented. Ingrid's hard-earned vacation. It's her 40th birthday and Ingrid has decided to treat herself to an all-inclusive holiday in Portugal. She's wandering through her neighborhood mall when she discovers a travel agency that she hadn't noticed before. There she meets Sheldon, who runs the place, and tells him of her exciting plans. I just feel I need to get away and pamper myself at long last, Ingrid says to Sheldon as she sits down in a chair facing his desk. She smooths out her dress over her knees and looks down to her right. I'm under so much pressure at work that I really feel I need to unwind. Sighing, she crosses one leg over the other, leans forward and shakes her head slightly. The tension at the office is eating me alive. Sheldon is delighted. An obvious sail sitting right there in front of him. He leans back in his chair, opens his arms wide, then slaps his hands together sharply and smiles at Ingrid. Oh, boy, he says, have I got the dream vacation for you. He rifles through a pile of brochures on his desk. Just feast your eyes on this. He hands Ingrid a colorful brochure, plastered with the usual palm trees and bright blue skies. Then he continues his pitch without waiting for her reactions. Looks fantastic, eh? Check out the color of the water. Brilliant turquoise. Look at those cute villas and their red tiled roofs. And can't you just picture yourself on that long white stretch of beach? He looks up and to his right, just imagining the view. Ingrid slides back into her chair, her heart sinking. Somehow, despite the gorgeous pictures in the brochure, despite Sydney's passionate descriptions, Portugal feels farther away than ever. What's the problem? By now you guessed it. Ingrid understands the world through her feelings. Look at her words. She feels that she wants to pamper herself. She longs to unwind from the pressure and the tension at the office. Her language, intonation and gestures are a giveaway. She looks down towards her feelings. What counts most to Ingrid is the way things feel. If Sheldon had been watching for cues, he would have gently led her towards a feeling of confidence and anticipation and warmth. Okay, Ingrid, he would have said. I follow you. I know what you mean about pressure. I have just the place for you. 
I've actually been there myself. The sand is soft and warm. And oh, the feel of those gentle waves as they break over you and around you. And the beds in these particular villas are amazingly comfortable and cool. He would have accessed the same channel that Ingrid has been tuned into for the past four decades. Sheldon should have taken the four steps of rapport by design to connect with his customer. One, adopting a really useful attitude to lead her towards his goal. Two, synchronizing her body language and voice tone during their conversation. Three, using open questions and actively listening for her responses. And four, picking up on all the clues to her preferred sense along the way. The clues I've given you towards spotting sensory preferences are, of course, generalizations. But when several of these generalizations point in the same direction, the chances are pretty good that you've discovered the primary way a person perceives and filters the world. This will be your most effective tool in establishing rapport and connecting with others. Chapter 10, Putting It All Together. People are drawn to one another and are eager to connect, to be liked. Successful communicators don't go out into the world every day loaded up with skills and techniques. They go out and take what they do for granted. It's in the letting go that the people, things and events in your life flow easily. This is the difference between those who struggle and get nowhere and those who appear to do very little and have everything. The more you act upon what you've learned here, the more you will effortlessly just assume rapport with other people. But of course you must practice, but soon it will be as natural as riding a bike or, or swimming, two other skills you only accomplished on the day you let go of worrying and had faith. This book is about connecting with your greatest resource, other people. It's about establishing rapport with them as you join together mentally. You've seen that rapport is the link between meeting and communicating, and how the quality and depth of rapport you establish can affect the outcome. Rapport can happen naturally or by design. We've looked at the meaning of communication as the response you get, and how, in order for your communication to achieve its desired outcome, a little KFC can go a long way. In fact, not just in communication, but in all the areas of your life where you want a positive result. The basic template for greeting someone new is open, eye, beam, high and lean. You're first with the open body language, eye contact, smile and high, and the lean sets you up for synchronizing. You can remember that when you point your heart at another person, you convey your openness. You can choose your attitude. A really useful attitude is paramount to how others perceive you and how you feel about yourself. You know that your attitude keeps you congruent or believable According to the three V's of communication, in other words, when you have a really useless attitude like anger, you look angry, you sound angry, and you use angry words, all unappealing. Conversely, it's easy to make yourself likable when you adopt a really useful attitude, let's say welcoming, because you look welcoming, you sound welcoming, and you use welcoming words, and it's attractive. We've covered body language, open and closed, and seen how along with facial expressions and gestures, it makes up 55% of what other people get from us. That's why it's so valuable in synchronizing for rapport by design. When we say, I like you to someone, what we really mean is, I am like you. In rapport by design, we don't wait hopefully to see if we have things in common. We move straight into synchronizing the body language, the voice tone and the words of the person we're meeting. We know that we have unconsciously been synchronizing emotional feedback all our lives from the people who have influenced us, our parents, our peers, our teachers and so on. And therefore it's easy and natural to synchronize other people in order to make them feel comfortable with us. In terms of talking with a new acquaintance, we've seen that questions are the generators of conversation, and they fall into two categories, open and closed. Open questions open people up, and that's the goal of conversation. You know that giving physical and spoken feedback will keep the ball in play. Conversation is about describing your experiences to others, and the more colorfully you can do it, the more you can talk in color, the better they can imagine and share your experiences and, as a consequence, increase the bonding and rapport you are creating by design. You have learnt, to your surprise and delight, that every person you meet or already know presents you with a sensory puzzle. Do they prefer to connect on a visual, an auditory or a kinesthetic wavelength? You've begun developing insight into their perceptions of the world around them. In fact, 
even if you've begun to implement the techniques in this book and got every one of them wrong, you're still getting it right because you've learned to be proactive with people as opposed to reactive or passive. There's absolutely no downside. You can't lose. If you are carefully observing people's body language and expressions, listening to their words, watching their eye movements, giving feedback and making conversations, you're being proactive. And they really can't help but like you as long as you have a really useful attitude. So where do I start? Let me reiterate that this is not a new way of being. It's not a new way of life. I haven't given you a magic wand to rush out in the street and start tapping people over the head and make them like you. These are tools and techniques that help you establish rapport quickly. We've covered the four basic areas of making people like you in 90 seconds or less. Attitude, synchronization, conversation and sensory preferences. Improvement in any one of these areas will increase your ability to communicate effectively and quickly with other people. As you learn to incorporate all four stages into your face-to-face -face encounters, the effects will become more and more apparent. You now know why you naturally connect with some people and not with others. And since starting this audiobook, you've probably thought of ways you can improve your relationships at home and at work. You can approach people with increased confidence and sincerity and enjoy each new experience. And you may be realizing that you already possess most of the skills you need for making natural connections with other people. The more you use the many tools we've shared throughout this audiobook, from the image you project with a really useful attitude to the sincerity and charisma you impart in your greeting, from the comfort and empathy generated by synchronizing to the ability to recognize which sense the person most relies upon, the more you'll be able to establish rapport with ease and make people like you in 90 seconds or less. If I had to assign a priority to these four aspects, a really useful attitude stands alone in its power to generate good feelings in yourself and in others. Attitude is infectious and obvious, and it precedes you. Your attitude carries the coherent focus of your body language, your voice tone, and the words you use. You will notice an immediate improvement in your rapport skills the moment you begin to manage your attitude. On the flip side, if not properly managed, your attitude will work against you, and just as fast. Attitude can either attract or repel. Next, without doubt, is the amazing power of synchronizing. As you've seen, synchronizing is part of our natural makeup, and it's what we already do unconsciously with those people we like. When you meet someone and you want to establish quick rapport, start synchronizing immediately. It may feel odd at first unless you've done the exercises on synchronizing, in which case you'll wonder how you ever got along without it. One or even two days are ample to become proficient or even brilliant in this department. After all, you've been doing your whole life in one way or another with the people who are close to you. As your conversation skills improve and you encourage the other person to do plenty of talking, you'll find yourself having time to make observations about sensory preferences. Let this come gently. Do you remember those magic eye books from the early 90s? You'd, you'd gaze at some weird-looking picture and slowly, eventually, your eyes would refocus and you'd see a picture in 3D. Well, discovering sensory preferences is a bit like that. You look and you search and you get frustrated and then suddenly you refocus on people and they start to look different as you establish an elegant, deep rapport at the subconscious level where true unity is achieved. The unfolding and detection of someone's sensory preferences will continue after your 90 seconds and give you the vehicle to travel much deeper into rapport by design with your new person, your newest great resource. So... You're at a conference and you've just met Sylvie Clareau, head of the department you'd like to work for. The connecting is smooth, warm, sincere and respectful. Your really useful attitude and openness made for a perfect greeting. Although there are seven people at the meeting, you synchronize her body movements, but with no excess eye contact. Her subconscious picks it up. There is chance eye contact. She smiles politely. You acknowledge. Bingo! You've been practicing this daily and have easily realized that by her dress, her voice, her choice of words, eye movements and tonality, she's probably auditory. When you speak, you synchronize her voice tone and use auditory words. Well, that sounds great. Everybody on the team has voiced an opinion. How can this stranger not like you when you look, sound and move so much like her? At the break, you get her to one side. I'd like to hear more about the proposal, you begin. Haven't we met before, she asks. I think she likes you, whispers the little voice in your head. Assuming rapport. As I write this book, I assume I like you, the listener. I assume I need you, and I assume you need me. And what's more, I assume I'm right. 
This is what gives me the confidence to keep on going. We need each other. That's the real basis for our rapport. And here we are, connecting. We can harness the power of imagination to make useful assumptions. We receive so much information from our five senses that we can't possibly process it all consciously. Instead, it gets sorted into three separate lots. The main batch of information you actually delete from your conscious. For example, you weren't aware of your left foot until I just drew your attention to it, and you probably haven't got a clue how your fingernails grow. The second batch, you distort. You feed into your imagination and play around with it, imagining your upcoming vacation or getting paranoid about the battery in your smoke detector, that sort of thing. And the third batch is stored away under the heading of generalizations or assumptions. When you've seen one frying pan, you can make a fair assumption that that big metal thing on your neighbor's stove with the long handle and the sizzling pancakes in it is also a frying pan. You don't have to find out all over again what it is. Your brain will make a generalized assumption, but assumptions at their best are great for learning, but at their worst, they lead to bias, unfair, limiting, and, and even dangerous fantasies. If your imagination has been distorting information in the past to scare you away from people, all I ask is your understanding that your imagination is tricking you into making negative assumptions about people based on past experience. In this case, your imagination is running the show, and the score is imagination one, you zero. Get your imagination under control. See it for the fun vehicle it is, and use it to install some really useful assumptions. Here are a few to get you going. After hearing them, close your eyes, as long as you're not driving, and see what they will look, sound, and feel like. Assume rapport and trust between yourself and other people. Assume that you'll like them and they'll like you. Assume that what you'll be doing with other people, connecting, synchronizing, etc., will work. Assume that others will give you the benefit of the doubt, and you'll do the same for them. Assume that what you've learned from this audio book will work for you because it's worked for thousands of other people. Assume that you're making a difference in the lives of the individuals you meet. Assume that this difference is for the better, not just in their lives, but also in your community as a whole. Assume that a connected community is a place where we encourage, uplift, and promote each other. People who connect live longer. People who connect get cooperation. And people who connect feel safe and strong. People who connect evolve. Together we rise and fall. Together we sink or swim. Together we laugh and cry. And when all is said and done, it's people that make the hard times bearable and the good times much, much sweeter. In closing, here's a modern day parable. Lately, I've been giving a lot of talks to high school students. Many of them are looking for part-time or summer employment, and they need to sharpen their job-seeking and people skills. I'll never forget one particular student who suddenly interrupted my talk. Hey, man, I've gone to a lot of job interviews and they never hire me, he griped. I, I tried at the grocery store, the drugstore, and an office. Other students around him began to snicker. The reason was pretty clear. The young man was wearing torn army pants, a T-shirt with the words rancid splashed across the front. That's the name of a thrash punk band. His left ear was pierced in three places, and he had a nose ring, too. But even more to the point, he sported a bright green mohawk that stood up six inches high on his otherwise shaved head. What do you want? I asked him. Well, a job. What do you think? Have you thought of changing what you're doing to get it? He glared at me, his arms crossed tightly over his chest. Changing what? Well, how about the way you look? I asked. No way, man. If they don't like how I look, that's discrimination. Look. I see your point, I said. He was obviously visual. But we both know how the world works. So what do you want? The job or the haircut? There was a long silence. Finally uncrossed his arms and rolled his eyeballs up as well. The job, I guess, he muttered. Some of the other students laughed good-naturedly. Then slowly, he began to laugh too. Then we all laughed. Because, you know, that's what it's all about. This book is about connecting with other people because other people are our greatest resource. We can't live without other people. We can't die without other people. When other people like you, they see the best in you. Thank you for listening to How to Make People Like You in 90 Seconds or Less by Nicholas Boothman. This is released for the sake of education. This is a brief key insight about all the concepts of the book.
Books we provide free audiobooks, key insights, summaries and brief study notes on the concepts of the books. So make sure to subscribe and become a part of our family. Thank you for listening to our quick learning audiobook review series. If you like what you heard, then check out our channel for more free audiobook reviews. We post new audiobooks every week. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell to be first to hear of our latest reviews.